Welcome to a journey into the heart of the mysteries of hidden knowledge and ancient wisdom. Join us as we delve into the depths of the Corpus Hermeticum, attributed to the legendary Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great, the messenger of the gods, and the guardian of the secrets of the universe. Within the pages of this ancient text are encoded the secrets of the cosmos, the mysteries of creation, and the fundamental principles that govern existence itself. Since the dawn of humanity, the hermetic teachings have fascinated seekers of wisdom, alchemists and philosophers alike, drawing those who yearn to unveil the deepest mysteries of the universe. But beware, dear listeners, for the knowledge that awaits within these pages is not for the faint of heart or those seeking easy answers. In the Corpus Hermeticum, truths are hidden that defy conventional conceptions of time, space and reality itself. Prepare to be transported to a realm of magic and mystery, where truth and illusion intertwine in an eternal dance. Abandon all preconceptions and let yourself be carried away by the voice of Hermes Trismegistus as we immerse ourselves in the fascinating world of the Corpus Hermeticum. One day as I meditated on essential matters and my heart soared to the heights, all my bodily sensations completely numbed, as if someone who after eating too much or due to great physical fatigue, is overtaken by a deep sleep. Then it seemed to me that I saw an immense being of inexplicable size who called me by my name and asked me what I wanted to see, hear, learn and know in my heart. Who are you? I asked. I am Pimander, he replied, the self-sufficient spirit. I know what you desire and I am with you in every place. I desire to be instructed in essential matters, to understand their nature, and to know God. Oh, how I wish to understand, I said. Keep well in your consciousness what you wish to learn, and I will instruct you, he replied. Upon hearing these words, he changed appearance, and everything was instantly revealed to me. I had an infinite vision, everything transformed into a single serene and joyful light, the contemplation of which brought me extreme happiness. Shortly after, in a part of this light, a dreadful and dark obscurity descended and spiralled in sinuous serpent-like coils, or so it seemed to me. Then this darkness transformed into a moist and indescribably murky nature, from which rose a smoke resembling fire, producing a sound like an indescribable moan. Finally, a cry rang out from this moist nature, an incomprehensible call that I likened to the voice of fire, for a sacred word spread from the light onto the moist nature, and a pure, subtle, fiery and powerful fire burst forth. The air, by its lightness, followed the breath of the fire, while the earth and water rose towards the fire, seeming to be suspended within it. The earth and water remained where they were, so closely intertwined that they could not be distinguished separately, constantly stirred by the breath of the word that hovered over them. Do you understand what this vision signifies? Pimander asked me. I will discover it, I replied. This light, it is I, he said to me. You are the one who existed before the moist nature, who came from the darkness, the luminous word emanating from the noose is the Son of God. What does this mean? I asked. Understand that what you see and hear within yourself is the word of the Lord, and the noose is God the Father. They are not separate from each other, for they are united in life. I thank you, I said. Raise your heart towards the light, and know it. As he spoke these words, he looked into my eyes for a moment, so intensely that it made me tremble. When he raised his head, I saw in the light composed of countless forces a truly limitless world. Meanwhile, the fire, invested and subdued by an almighty force, had reached equilibrium. In the noose, you have seen the beautiful original form of man, the archetype, the original principle before the endless principle, Pimander told me. Where do the elements of nature come from? I asked. From the will of God who, having received the word within itself and contemplated the archetype of the world in its model beauty, created from the inherent elements of this world an ordered world and the souls born of God. God the spirit in itself both masculine and feminine, source of light and life, with a word engendered a second spiritual being, the Demiurge, who, as the god of fire and breath, created seven rulers to encircle the sensible world with circles, 
and to govern it by what is called fate. Thus the lower elements of nature were left to their fate, devoid of reason, thus becoming mere matter. But the demiurge, united with the word, enclosing the circles and giving them swift rotation, set in motion the cycle of creatures, from an indeterminate beginning to an endless end, for at the end lies the beginning, according to the will of the spirit. This rotation of circles produced from the fallen elements animals devoid of reason, for the word was no longer within them. The air produced winged animals, the water aquatic animals, according to the will of the spirit. The earth and water separated, and the earth brought forth from its bosom the animals it contained, quadrupeds, reptiles, wild and domestic animals. The spirit, the father of all beings, who is life and light, engendered a man in his image of great beauty, whom he loved as his own son. Thus God fell in love with his own form and entrusted all his works to him. However, when man observed the creation formed in the fire by the demiurge, he also desired to create, and the Father permitted it. As he entered into the domain of the demiurge's creation, where he should have had full freedom to create, he observed the works of his brother while the rulers fell in love with him, each associating him with their own rank in the hierarchy of spheres. But when he knew their absence, and partook of their nature, he wished to cross the limit of the circles and to know the power of him who rules the fire. Thus, as governor of the world of mortal beings and animals devoid of reason, man bowed, broke the cohesive force of the spheres he had torn quickly, and showed himself to the lower nature in the beautiful form of God. At the sight of the man who embodied within himself inexhaustible beauty and all the energies of the seven rulers in the guise of God, Nature smiled with love. Seeing the features of this form magnificently reflected in the water, and seeing his work on the earth, he fell in love with the water of nature, so similar to himself, and desired to dwell in it. His wish was immediately granted, and he inhabited the form, devoid of reason. Nature, receiving her lover within her, embraced him entirely, and they became one, for the fire of their desire was fervent. Thus, among all creatures of nature, man alone is dual, that is, mortal for his body, and immortal for his fundamental being. Man Indeed, although he is immortal and sovereign of all things, man nevertheless undergoes the conditions of mortals, for he is subject to fate, despite his origin from a realm superior to the cohesive force of the spheres. Although being both masculine and feminine, born of a masculine and feminine father, and devoid of sleep, being born of a sleepless being, he is overcome by the lust of the senses and sleep. O spirit within me, I too am enamoured of the word, I told him. What I am about to tell you is the mystery that has remained hidden until now. Nature, united with man, has created an astonishing wonder. Man had within him, as I have told you, the essence of the seven rulers, both masculine and feminine, of vertical stature. Now I burn with an extraordinary desire to hear from you, said P. Manda. Let us proceed, I beg of you, I said, shouting. Be silent, for I have not yet finished my initial discourse, he replied. I will be silent, I answered. The generation of these first seven men occurred, as I have told you, in the following manner. The earth was the womb, water the generative element, fire led the formation process to maturity, and from ether nature received the breath of life and generated bodies in the likeness of man. Man, born of life and light, became soul and spirit. Life transformed into soul, light became no, and all beings of the sensible world remained thus until the end of time and the beginning of species. Now listen to what you wished to hear. When this cycle came to its conclusion, the bond that held all things together broke, according to the will of God. All animals, which until then had been male and female, divided, just as man divided into two genders, one became male and the other female. Immediately God spoke the holy word. Increase and multiply in multitude all those who have been created and made, and let him who possesses the noose know that he is immortal, and that the cause of death is the love of the body and earthly things. Having thus spoken God through his providence, united couples through fate and the cohesive force of spheres, establishing reproduction. All beings multiply, each according to its own kind, 
and he who recognizes his immortality is chosen among the others, while he who loves the body, born of the error of desire, continues to wander in darkness and must undergo the experience of death. What a grave fault, then, I exclaimed, of those who are in ignorance, depriving them of immortality. I do not think you have reflected on what you have heard, he replied. I did not ask you to listen. I am reflecting, I said. Now I remember, and I thank you. If you have thought about it, tell me why those who are in death deserve to die. Because the source from which their bodies come is the dark obscurity produced by the moist nature, which formed the body in the sensible world where death quenches its thirst. You have understood that well. But why does he who recognizes himself turn to God, as the divine word says? I asked. Because, I answered, the Father of all things from whom man comes is light and life. Yes, light and life are God, the Father from whom man is born. So if you know that you come from life and light, and that you are made of these elements, you will return to life. These were the words of Pimanda. But tell me more, O Pimanda, how will I return to life? Because God said that the man who possesses the noose does not know himself, not all men possess the noose. Pay attention to what you say, I, Pimanda, only go to those who are holy, good, pure, and merciful. My presence is an aid to them, so that they may know everything at once. They become pleasing to the Father through their love, and thank Him with affectionate filial love, as well as with the hymns of praise that are due to Him, before leaving their bodies for the death that is inherent to them. They disdain their senses, for they know too well their activities. Yes, I, the noose, will not allow the activities of the body that assail them to exert their influence on them, as the guardian of the gates. Indeed, I will introduce the entrance to evil and shameful actions, and I will expiate the impious. Chapter 2 Mander and Hermes keep silent, or Hermes Trismegistus, and remember well what I am going to teach you. I will immediately tell you what comes to mind. Hermes, you are talked about everywhere in the universe and God, but opinions are so contradictory that I cannot discern the truth. Will you enlighten me, O Master? I will only believe what you reveal to me. Learn, my son, the relationship between God and the universe, that is, God, eternity, the world, time, and becoming. God creates eternity, eternity creates the world, the world creates time, time creates becoming. The essence of God is goodness, beauty, felicity, and wisdom. The essence of eternity is immutability. The essence of the world is order. The essence of time is change, and the essence of becoming is life and death. The spirit and the soul are the active and revealing force of God, permanence and immortality. Such are the actions of eternity. Denaturalization and return to perfection. Such are the actions of the world. Growth and decline. Such are the actions of time. Ownership. Such is the action of becoming. Thus eternity resides in God. The world resides in eternity. Time resides in the world. And becoming resides in time. While eternity rests around God, the world moves within eternity. Time is fulfilled within the world, and becoming evolves within time. God is therefore the origin of all things. His essence is eternity, and the world is his matter. Eternity is the potential force of God. The work of eternity is the world, which had no beginning but is constantly evolving under the action of eternity. Therefore nothing in the world will ever die because eternity is incorruptible, and nothing will ever be annihilated because eternity completely envelops the world. But what is the wisdom of God? It is goodness, beauty, felicity, total virtue, and eternity. Eternity transforms the world into order by permeating matter with the permanence of immortality. The evolution of matter depends on eternity, just as eternity itself depends on God. There is evolution and time both in heaven and on earth, but they are of different nature. In heaven they are immutable and imperishable. On earth they are changing and perishable. God is the soul of eternity, eternity is the soul of the world, and heaven is the soul of the earth. God resides in the news, the news resides in the soul, the soul resides in matter, and all these things exist through eternity. This great body that encompasses all bodies is inwardly full and outwardly enveloped by a soul, conscious of the spirit and imbued with God. 
a soul that animates the entire universe. Outwardly, this life, sufficient and perfect, which is the world with all living creatures in it, remains immutable above heaven, always identical to itself. Below, on earth, it causes the changes of becoming. Eternity sustains all this, for everything we call fate, providence, nature, or anything else is an activity of the Creator. He who accomplishes all this through his activity is God, the active and revealing force of God, whose potential force surpasses everything and to which nothing human or divine can be compared. So, Hermes, do not believe that anything below or above is like God, for you would stray from the truth. Nothing is comparable to the incomparable, the sole God of the universe. Do you not believe that he shares his potential power with anyone? Who else but the creator of life, of immortality and of change could have done this? God is not inactive, otherwise the whole cosmos would be so, for everything is filled with God. Therefore there is no inactivity anywhere, neither in the world nor in any being. Inactivity is an empty word for both the creator and the creature. Everything must be created according to the influence of each place. The Creator lives in all His creatures. He does not dwell in one alone, but creates in all, for He is always an active force. He does not merely create beings, but also takes care of them. Look for yourself at the world before your eyes and consider how beautiful it is, a pure and incorruptible body, inwardly young and robust, always growing in strength. Always look at the seven fundamental worlds formed according to an eternal origin, and each following its own course, together fill eternity. Light is everywhere, but fire nowhere. For the love and fusion of opposites and dissimilarities have become the light that shines through the revealing power of God, the creator of all good, the Lord and Prince of every order of the seven worlds. Look at the moon that runs ahead of all the worlds, an instrument of natural growth transforming the matter of this world. See the earth at the center of the universe, established as the foundation of this beautiful world, nurturing and caring for everything that lives on it. Observe the countless multitude of immortal beings and the great multitude of mortals, and see how the moon describes its orbit between mortals and immortals. All things are filled with soul. All beings move according to their own nature, some in heaven, others on earth. Those who should be on the right do not go to the left, and vice versa. Those who should be above do not descend, and those who should be below do not ascend. I do not need to show you, my dear Hermes, that all these beings have been engendered, our bodies, possess a soul, and are in motion. However, all these beings cannot form a unity without someone to unite them. Thus this person must exist, and must be absolutely unique, for as the movements are different and multiple, and the bodies are also dissimilar, as long as there is a speed imposed on them collectively, there cannot be two or more creators. If this were the case, the unity of the order would not be maintained, and jealousy would arise in the most powerful subject. Let us suppose that there are several creators for changing and mortal beings. This one would want to create also immortal beings, and likewise, the creator of immortals would want to create mortal beings as well. Furthermore, let us suppose that there are two creators when on one side there is matter and on the other there is soul. To whom would we attribute creation? And if both contributed, who would have the larger share? Remember that a living body is composed of both matter and soul, both the immortal and the mortal, the rational and the irrational. All living bodies are animated. Everything that has no life is simply matter. While the soul is the only cause of life and remains in the hands of the Creator, the Creator of the Immortals is therefore also the one who initiates life, and for other living beings, the mortals. How could the one who is immortal and creates immortality not also create everything that belongs to the living? That there is someone who creates all this is clear, that it is one is evident. For the soul is one, life is one, matter is one. Who then is the Creator? Who but the unique God, to whom but God, belongs the creation of living and animated beings? That is why God is unique. It is truly curious, while you acknowledge that there is only one world, one sun, one moon, and one divine nature, you believe that God is multiple. Thus, it is God who creates all things. Moreover, 
What a wonder that God creates life, soul, immortality, and change at the same time that you yourself perform so many different acts. Seeing, speaking, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, walking, thinking, breathing. So it is not another who sees, another who hears, another who speaks, walks, thinks, and breathes. It is one being who accomplishes all this. So the divine activities are inseparable from God, for if, like you, he were to cease from performing all his activities, it has been demonstrated that no being can exist in inactivity, a fortiori God. If indeed there were something that God had not created, it would be imperfect, for God is not inactive, but on the contrary perfect. He is the creator of all things. If you listen a little more, O Hermes, you will certainly understand that God does not have his own purpose to fulfill, but rather everything that becomes, everything that has been done in the past and everything that will be done in the future. That, my beloved, is life, that is beauty, that is goodness, that is God. If you want to understand all this from your own experience, observe what happens within you when you want to engender. However, when it comes to God, the act of engendering is not the same. God certainly feels no perceivable joy, and no one collaborates with him since he acts entirely alone. He is always immanent in his works, and he himself is what engenders, both creator and creation. For if his creatures were to separate from him, they would collapse and inevitably die, for he would have withdrawn life from them. But since everything lives and life is one, God is surely unique. On the other hand, as everything in heaven and on earth is alive and life is one in all, the life created by God is in itself all that lives. Thus, everything comes to life through the work of God, and life is the union of soul and spirit. As for death, it is not the destruction of the elements brought together, but the breaking of unity. Thus eternity is the image of God, the world is the image of eternity, the sun is the image of the world, and man is the image of the sun. As for change, the common man calls it death, because the body dissolves and life withdraws into the invisible. Therefore, I declare to you, O my beloved Hermes, that beings that disappear in this way simply transform. Every day a part of the world passes into the invisible, but in no way to be annihilated. The suffering of the world lies in what is called death, for rotation is revolution, and disappearance is renewal. The world holds all forms, it does not keep them locked within itself, but transforms into these forms and through them. So since the world is created in multiple forms, what then will be its creator like? We cannot say that he has no form, and if he were also multiple, he would be like the world. But if he had a single form, he would then be inferior to the world in this respect. So what shall we decide? For our conception of God cannot be lacking. There is only one form proper to God, a form that corporeal eyes cannot perceive, a form belonging to the mind that manifests all forms through bodies. Do not be surprised that there can be an incorporeal form. Think of the word you utter. It is the same with paintings. One sees the peaks of mountains rising towards the sky when in reality they are smooth and flat. Reflect deeper on what I have told you. If just as man cannot live without life, God cannot live without creating good. Indeed, the life and movement of God, granting to all the movement of life, requires a particular understanding for certain things, for example. All things are in God, but as in a determined place, located in material and immobile places. What occupies a place somewhere has no movement in the incorporeal, things appear differently. By thinking of the one who contains everything within himself, Understand above all that nothing can limit the incorporeal, and nothing is faster or more powerful than he who is limitless, the fastest and the most powerful. Also, think of yourself. Command your soul to go to India, and it will be there more quickly than your command. Command it to go to the ocean, and it will be there instantaneously, not by travelling from one place to another, but as if it were already there. Command it even to rise into the sky, you will not need wings to do so. No one can prevent it, neither the sun's fire, nor the ether, nor the revolution of the sky, nor the bodies of the stars. It will ascend in its flight to the last celestial body. Even if you wanted to traverse the vault of the universe and behold what lies beyond, 
If there is anything beyond the world, you could do it. Look at the power, the swiftness he possesses. And if you can do all this, could not God? Thus conceive God in this way. Everything that is, everything he contains within himself, such as his thoughts, the world itself, the universe. If you cannot equal God, you cannot understand him, for only the like comprehends its equal. Grow until you are of immense greatness, surpass all bodies, rise above time, become eternity, and then you will understand God. Enter into the thought that nothing is impossible for you. Consider yourself immortal and capable of understanding everything, the arts, the sciences, the nature of all that lives. Ascend higher than any height, descend lower than any depth. Gather within yourself the sensations of all that has been created, of fire and water, of dryness and moisture. Imagine yourself being everywhere at once, on earth, in the sea, in the air that has not yet been created, being in the mother's womb, being young, old, being dead, and beyond death. If you can encompass all this at once in your consciousness, time, place, events, qualities, and quantities, then you will understand God. But if you keep your soul imprisoned in the body, if you degrade it by saying, I understand nothing, I am nothing, I am afraid of the sea, I cannot ascend to heaven, I do not know what I have been or what I will be. What then can you have to do with God? Because you cannot grasp by thought what is truly beautiful. As long as you love the body and are evil, the greatest vice is not to know the divine, but to be capable of knowing it, to have the will and the powerful hope for it. This is the direct path to goodness, an easy path wherever you go. You will recognize it on the path wherever you are, even where and when you do not expect it, whether you are vigilant, whether you rest in the water or on land, by day or by night, whatever you say or keep to yourself, for there is nothing that is not. Will you now say that God is invisible, that more than God has created everything so that you may know him through all his creatures? What is wonderful is that God manifests himself through all his creatures, for nothing is impossible even among the incorporeal. The soul, the spirit, reveal themselves in living contemplation, and God manifests himself in his creative activity. All this, O Trismegistus, I had to reveal to you. Consider the rest in the same way and do not lose yourself. Chapter 3 The great evil of man is that he does not know God. Where are men rushing, obscured because they have become intoxicated with empty words of Genesis, words of total ignorance that they cannot bear, and that they are already beginning to vomit? Stop, shine again with the eyes of the heart, and if all cannot, at least those who can. For the scourge of ignorance overwhelms the whole earth, endangers the soul imprisoned in the body, and prevents it from entering into the calm of salvation. Do not let yourself be carried away by the violence of the current, but let those who are above you and able to reach the calm of salvation use the countercurrent to enter it. Seek one who will take you by the hand and guide you to the gates of Genesis, where the light shines clearly, where darkness does not reign, where no one is intoxicated, where all remain clear-headed and lift the eyes of the heart to the one who wants to be known. But know this well, no one can hear his voice, pronounce his name, the eyes of the flesh cannot behold him, only the soul, the spirit, is capable of it. Therefore, tear first the garment you wear, the fabric of ignorance, the cause of the plague, the chain of corruption, the dark prison, the living dead, the spiritless corpse, the tomb you carry everywhere. The thief who dwells within you shows his hatred for everything he loves and his jealousy for everything he hates. It is the malevolent garment with which you cover yourself, the garment that prevents you from breathing, that lowers you and confuses you with it so that you can no longer see it, and that at the sight of the beauty of the truth and the good it contains, you can no longer continue to hate this scourge, discovering the traps and snares it lays for you for it dulls your senses. Chapter 4. Speech of Hermes in Honor of God God, His power, and His divine nature are the glory of the universe. God is the beginning, the original idea, the power of growth, and the material substance of all creatures. Wisdom for the manifestation of all things, divine power is the principle of birth, growth, energy, destiny, death, and regeneration. There was boundless darkness and water in the abyss, and the creative breath began to act. Everything was chaos by the power of God. When the sacred light appeared, 
the fundamental elements emerged from the moist substance, became denser, and all the gods united and stood upright. The fruitful aspects of nature emerged from the indeterminate and shapeless. The light elements rose while the heavy elements settled in the moist sand, so that the universe in its component parts differentiated by the action of fire and was ordered by the breath of creation, remaining in constant motion. The universe formed into seven circles, and the gods appeared as stars with all their constellations. Nature, in all its aspects, with the assistance of the gods who inhabited it, took shape in an ordered structure, and the surrounding circle was enveloped in an astral cloud where the divine breath imprinted a circular movement. Each god, according to his own power, produced what was entrusted to him. Thus were born quadrupeds, reptiles, aquatic and saline animals, fertile seeds, grass and all flowers, and the seed of rebirth was enclosed in each of them. Likewise the gods brought forth the generations of men so that they could know the works of God witness the activities of nature, increase in number, have absolute power over everything under the sky, and learn to recognize the good. So it thrives by growing and multiplying, and the gods created souls that were sown into flesh by fate at the command of the gods of the inner circles, so that they might know precisely the arched sky, the course of the celestial gods, the divine works and the activity of nature. Learn to know true good, and the divine power that maintains the movement of the wheel of destiny. And thus to distinguish good from evil, to fully acquire the sublime art of doing good works, and thus, in their journey from the beginning, as they experience, they realize that their destiny depends on the circular march of time. Finally they are freed, and leave behind great monuments on earth, sublime works that they accomplish once liberated. And all that, over time, casts a shadow and spreads darkness, the birth of creatures of flesh with soul, generation in the manner of young animals, all human work, all that diminishes, will be regenerated by destiny, by the regeneration of gods and centuries of nature. When their divine is the cosmos melted into unity, regenerating by nature, for even nature is rooted in the omnipotence of God. Chapter 5 excerpt from a speech of Hermes. Sit down, my son. I make this declaration out of love for mankind and in humble devotion to God, for there is no piety truer than considering essential things and showing gratitude to him who is the author, which I will never cease to do. But what is real and true, my son, for living rightly? Live in the service of God. He who is truly pious will love wisdom above all for without the love of wisdom it is impossible to attain the highest piety. He who has learned the essence of everything, and has learned how, why, and for whom everything is arranged, will thank God, the master builder of the world, like an infinitely good father, who bestows blessings and faithfully protects. By confessing his gratitude he will be pious, and through his piety he will know where truth is, what it is, and through this deep vision his piety will become stronger and stronger. Even though the soul is in the body, my son, it never descends back in the opposite direction when it sheds the burden of its debts to truly understand the good and the true. When the soul learns who called it into existence, it is filled with immense love, forgets all evil, and cannot separate from the good. This, my son, mine, must be the only path to truth that our ancestors also walked and from which they received good. The path is sublime and clear, but difficult and arduous for the soul while it is in the body. The soul must first direct the struggle against itself, provoke a deep decision, and yield to victory over itself. One part emerges, a conflict between one part and the other two begins. The first tries to escape while the other two try to pull it down. This results in a struggle and a great expenditure of strength between the part that wants to escape and those trying to hold it back. However, it is not the same if one wins or if the other two win. The first part strongly aspires to the good while the others reside in the realms of perdition. One, filled with sorrow, wants to regain freedom, while the others cherish slavery. When both parties are defeated, they remain locked within themselves, inactive and isolated, abandoned by the one who rules. But if the first is defeated, it is captured by the other two, 
stripped of everything and punished for the life it leads here. Look, my son, what guides you on the path to freedom before you die. First, you must renounce your body and overcome the life engaged in the struggle. Then, after winning this victory, you must return to the origin. And now, my son, I will summarize the essentials in short sentences. You will understand what I say if you remember what you have already heard. All that exists is in motion, only what is alive is immobile. All that exists is in motion, only what is not alive is immobile. All bodies are subject to change, but not all bodies can dissolve. Not all creatures are mortal, nor are all creatures immortal. That which dissolves is ephemeral, the immovable is eternal. That which is constantly reborn always dies, but that which is formed once and for all never extinguishes and never transforms into something else. The first is God, the second is the cosmos, and the last is man. The cosmos is for man and man is for God. The sensitive part of the soul is mortal, the rational part is immortal. All manifested reality is immortal but transformable. Every being is dual, nothing that exists is at rest. Not all things are moved by a soul, but there is a soul that moves every being. All that is sensitive feels through suffering. Every being subject to pain is also subject to joy. Meaning the mortal creature that experiences joy does not necessarily experience pain, nor does the immortal creature. Every body is subject to disease. Every body subject to disease is subject to dissolution. The noose is in God, reason is in man. The noose is impervious to suffering. Nothing true is in the mortal body. Nothing false is in the immortal body. Everything that is born is subject to change, but not everything that is born extinguishes. Nothing good is on earth, nothing bad is in heaven. God is good, man is bad. Good acts voluntarily, evil acts involuntarily. The gods desire that good actions have good intentions. The good order is sublime justice. The good order is law. Divine law is time. Human law is evil. Time is the rotation of the world. Time is the destroyer of man. In heaven nothing is changing. On earth everything is changing. Nothing is subjected or subordinate in heaven. Nothing is free on earth. There is no ignorance in heaven. There is no knowledge on earth. The earthly has no part in the heavenly. Everything in heaven is spotless and uncontaminated. Everything on earth is condemnable. The divine is mortal. That which is sown does not always germinate. That which is born has always been sown. For the corruptible body, there are two periods of time, from conception to birth and from birth to death. For the incorruptible body, there is only one temporal purpose that begins with creation. Corruptible bodies grow and decline, matter oscillating between formation and destruction. Incorruptible matter effects change within itself or in what is similar to it. For man, birth is the beginning of death, and death is the beginning of birth, that which is born also dies, while that which dies also comes from essential things. Some are in the body, others in the world of ideas, others in the world of forces. The body is also in the world of ideas, but the idea and the force are also in the body. The divine does not participate in what is corruptible, and the mortal does not participate in the divine. The mortal does not enter the immortal body, but the immortal can enter the mortal parts. Divine forces manifest without moving upwards but downwards. Nothing that happens on earth serves what happens in heaven, but everything that happens in heaven is of vital importance to what belongs to earthly life. Heaven is the abode of incorruptible bodies. Earth is the abode of bodies that corrupt. Earth lacks reason. Heaven is in accord with divine reason. Celestial harmonies are the foundation of heaven. Earthly laws are imposed on earth. Heaven is the first element, earth the last. Providence is divine order, destiny the servant of providence. Chance is blind and disorderly movement, an illusory force that seems to deceive. Who is God? The unchangeable, inflexible good. Who is man? Evil turning against itself. If you keep these phrases in mind, you will have no difficulty in finding the detailed explanations I have given you, for these phrases are the summary. However, avoid speaking of them and debating with the crowd, not because you want to withhold your treasures from them, 
but because they will simply mock you. The words I have spoken to you attract only a very small number of listeners, perhaps not even one from that small number. These words also have this peculiarity, they incite the wicked even more towards evil. Therefore be wary of the crowd, for it understands neither liberating power nor the splendor of teaching. What do you mean by that, Father? This human animal life is exceedingly inclined towards evil. It has evil from its birth and delights in itself. If this animal nature learns that the world was created one day, and that everything happens according to providence and destiny, for it is indeed fate that governs all, will it not be much worse? Because if this animal nature despises the universe for having been created one day and attributes the cause of evil to destiny, it will eventually not refrain from any evil action. That is why one must be vigilant towards it, so that it acts as little as possible in its ignorance for fear of what it cannot understand internally. Chapter 6 Universal Dialogue Between Hermes and Asclepius Hermes, Asclepius, nothing is immobile, everything that is in motion is so for something. Asclepius, of course. Hermes, and what causes the movement must not be greater than the thing in motion. Asclepius, certainly. Hermes, is the cause of movement more powerful than the thing set in motion. Asclepius, it is evident. Hermes, and what causes the movement is necessarily of the same nature as the thing in motion, isn't it? Asclepius, by nature. Hermes, is not the cosmos greater than any other body? Asclepius, absolutely. Hermes, and it is not entirely filled, particularly by other large bodies, and more precisely by all existing bodies. Asclepius, that is true. Hermes, so, is the cosmos a body? Asclepius, yes. Hermes, and also a body in motion. Asclepius, without a doubt. Hermes, then what must be the size of the space in which the cosmos moves, and what is its nature to allow its continuous movement without hindrance or stop? Asclepius, this space must be extremely vast, thrice greatest. Hermes, and of what nature, what contrary nature is it not? Asclepius, it is not contrary, thrice greatest. Hermes, exactly. So space has no form, but it is of a divine nature, or even God himself. By divine, I do not refer to that which is created, but to that which is uncreated. If it is divine, it is of the same nature as the fundamental essence of creation, and if it is God, it is one with the fundamental essence. This is how thought conceives it. God is for us the highest thought, but not for God, because he who thinks reaches the object of his thought through inner vision, God is not for him the object of his thought. He is not different from the essence of his thought. He is his own thought. Yet God is very different from us, which is why he is the object of our thought. If we think of universal space, we do not think of it as space, but as God. And if space does not present itself as God, then there is no longer space in the ordinary sense of the term, but the active divine force that encompasses everything. Everything that is in motion does not move in something that is itself immobile, but in something that is immobile. And the very driving force is immobile, because it cannot be part of the movement it causes. Bodies that produce movement. Hermes. Certainly not, Asclepius, it is not the body itself that causes the movement of inanimate things, but what is inside that body, and that causes both the body that moves and what is in motion. So, the inanimate cannot move the inanimate. Do you see then the heavy burden your soul bears when it must support alone two bodies? It is evident that what is in motion moves in something and for something. Asclepius. Movement does not occur in empty space. Thrice greatest, Hermes. Listen well, Asclepius. Nothing that is truly empty, nothing that is part of true being, is empty. As the word being already implies, that is to say, to manifest. Indeed, what is would have no reality if it were not filled with reality. So, what is real, what truly manifests, can never be empty. Asclepius, there is nothing empty. Thrice greatest, Hermes, like a jar, a pot, a tub, and other specific things. Hermes, thrice greatest. Stop, Asclepius. 
What error are you making? How can you consider as empty things that are totally full and filled? Asclepius, what do you mean? Thrice greatest, Hermes, is not air a body? Does this body not penetrate everything that exists and fill everything it penetrates? Are not all bodies composed of the four elements? Are not all the things you call empty filled with air? And if they are filled with air, are they not also filled with the four elemental bodies? By arriving at this conclusion, contrary to what you have said, all that you call full is empty of air, for the space is occupied by other bodies that leave no room for air. And all the things you say empty must be said to be full and not empty, for they are filled with air and breath. Asclepius. Nothing can oppose that. Thrice greatest, Hermes. But what is the space in which the universe moves? Asclepius. Is it incorporeal? Thrice greatest, Hermes. Yes, incorporeal. Asclepius. And what then is this incorporeal space? Thrice greatest, Hermes. It is the spirit entirely enclosed within itself, free from all body, which does not deviate, suffer, tangible, immutable in itself, which contains everything, saves everything, liberates everything, heals everything, from which emanate the rays of good, truth, the original principle of the spirit, and the original principle of the soul. Asclepius. But what then is God? Hermes, thrice greatest. He is none of these things, but the cause of our existence and of everything that is, as of each creature in particular, for he has left no place for non-being. Everything that exists comes from being and not from what is not, for non-being has no power to bring into existence, whereas being never ceases to be. Asclepius. What does God represent then? Hermes, thrice greatest. God is not reason, but the existential foundation of reason. He is not breath, but the existential foundation of breath. He is not light, but the existential foundation of light. Therefore God must be honoured by calling him the Good and the Father, names that only belong to him and no one else, for none of those who are called gods, nor any man nor any demon, can be good in any way. He alone is good and no other being. None of the other beings can contain the essence of good, for they are body and soul, and have no place where good can dwell. For good contains the essence of all creatures, both corporeal and incorporeal, perceptible as belonging to the world of abstract ideas. Thus is goodness, thus is God. Never qualify anything else as good, for that is impious. Never refer to God other than as being good, for that too is impious. Everyone likely uses the word good, but not everyone understands what it is. That is why not everyone understands God either, and, in their ignorance, call gods and some men who may be or become good, for good is God's absolute immutability and is separable from him, for he is truly God himself. We show respect to all gods as immortal beings calling them gods, but God is good not as a sign of respect, but by his own essence. God's essence and goodness in one form, the origin of generations, for he who is good gives everything and takes nothing. And truly God gives everything and takes nothing. Thus God is good, and goodness is him. Another name for God is Father, for he is the creator of all things. Indeed creating is the mark of the Father. Therefore the life of one whose consciousness is directed in the right direction, and who gives birth to the child, demands extreme gravity, ardent zeal, and deep devotion to God. To die without this decency is a great misfortune and a sin, for it is their punishment, the unborn soul of the child is doomed to take a body, neither male nor female, and to be a thing disapproved under the sun. If all possess this decency, surround with compassion those who are unfortunate enough to be deprived of it, for they know the punishment that awaits them. May these words, Asclepius, by their nature and extent, lead you to the elementary knowledge of the essence of everything. Chapter 7 Hermes' Discourse on Character and Unity Hermes considers the master builder of the world, for he created the entire universe, not with his hands, but by word, as present immutable reality, as the creator of all things, the only one who created everything according to his will. For he is truly his intangible, invisible, immeasurable, and indivisible body, which cannot be compared to any other body. He is neither fire, nor water, nor air, nor breath, but these things and all things are through him and from him, for he is good, 
he did not want this offering to be dedicated only to him, nor that he decorated the earth only for him. But, as a jewel of this divine body, he brought down man, a mortal creature, from an immortal being. And just as the earth surpasses its living creatures in eternal life, man surpasses his earthly creatures in intelligence and spirit. Man has become a contemplator of God's works, delighting in them and learning to know the Creator through them. This is how God endowed all men with intelligence, but not with spirit. None of this was due to any kind of jealousy, for jealousy does not come from above. It arises here on earth in the souls of those who do not possess spirit. Why did God not grant spirit to all men? Hermes wanted, my son, union with the spirit to be accessible to all souls, established as the reward of the race. Since they did not receive the powers of the spirit, and did not know why and for whom they had been created, the observations of these men who are forced to rely on their senses resemble those of animals devoid of intelligence. Their character is a mixture of passion and anger. They are not amazed by what deserves meditation and reflection and indulge in the desires and passions of the body, believing that man is born for that. As for those who have received a share of God's gifts, reason appears in all their actions. They are no longer mortal, but divine men, whose soul encompasses everything that exists on earth and in heaven. All those who have been raised contemplating the good learn to regard their sojourn here on earth as a disgrace. They judge all corporeal and incorporeal things as reprehensible and hasten to turn towards the One. The growing manifestation of the soul spirit, the formation of divine things and the contemplation of God are the gifts of the crater, the sacred vessel. O oh, Father, I too want to plunge into the crater. If you do not start by hating your body, my son, you cannot love your true self. On the other hand, if you love your true self, you will be the spiritual soul, and once in possession of the spiritual soul, you will also share in living knowledge. What do you mean by that, Father? My son, you cannot attach yourself to both material and divine things. There are two states of being, the corporeal and the incorporeal, the mortal and the divine. And you must choose between the two after mature reflection. Indeed, it is not possible to attach oneself to both. When your choice is made, demonstrate the diminution of what you have rejected by the active force of what you have chosen. Thus, the correct choice shows its glory, not only by making the man divine who made it, but also by demonstrating his attachment and devotion to God. Conversely, the wrong choice leads a man to his ruin. Moreover, it is a sin against God. Such people act like those who advance in procession in the middle of the road, unable to do anything for themselves, but hindering others in their path. They wander in the world, driven by the desires of the body. Therefore, the gifts that come from God have been entrusted to us and will always be. Let us therefore ensure that what emanates from us is worthy of that and is not inferior. For it is not God who causes our evil, but we ourselves who prefer it to good. Look, my son, how many vehicular states, how many crowds of demons, how many veils of matter and races of stars one must traverse to rise laboriously towards the One. Goodness is in no way an easy place to reach. Goodness is limitless and infinite. It has no beginning in itself, even if it may seem to us to have one in Genesis. God's universal knowledge, therefore, is not the beginning of goodness, but it offers us the principle of what we must learn about goodness. Therefore, let us begin and hasten to travel through all that awaits us, for it is difficult to leave the familiar and what one possesses to return to the old and the first. What is visible brings joy, while what is invisible arouses doubts and disbelief. For the ordinary eye, evil is known and manifest, but goodness is invisible. Goodness has neither figure nor form. It is immutable, like itself, and therefore different from everything else. Therefore the incorporeal is invisible to the corporeal man, just as everything that remains identical, the immutable, is far superior to what changes, and what changes is miserable. In comparison to the immutable, the indivisible unity, the origin and root of all things, is present in all things. Nothing is without origin. The starting point of everything, therefore, springs solely from itself. The number one contains within itself all other numbers as origin without being contained in any of them. Everything that generates is imperfect, divisible, grows, and diminishes. 
Therefore, perfection is none of these things. What grows increases with unity and falls back into its own weakness when it can no longer contain conformity. Thus, Otad, to the extent possible, I have placed before you the image of God as an example. If you absorb it inwardly with attention and persist in its contemplation with the eyes of the heart, believe me, my son, you will find the path to heaven. Better yet, the image of God himself will guide you on this path. This image, if turned inward, has the peculiarity of holding captive those who have turned to it, and like a magnet, it draws iron upward. Chapter 8 Hermes to his son. Tut. The invisible God is more manifest than he seems, O Tad. You will have a detailed explanation, so that your eyes open to the mysteries of God, who is above all names. Through inner contemplation, understand that he who seems invisible to ordinary mortals will be more manifest to you, for he would not truly be invisible if he were not. For everything that is visible has been formed and manifested once. Everything that cannot be perceived is for all eternity, for it does not need to manifest itself, it is eternal, and causes all things to manifest. It causes everything to manifest without manifesting itself. It creates without being created itself. It does not show itself in a perceptible form, but gives everything a form that can be perceived. For not only does what is created have a perceptible appearance, but to be born and become is nothing other than to enter into the visible. He who is not born is as invisible as lacking a perceptible appearance, but as he shapes all things, he is visible to all and in all, preferably to those to whom he wishes to manifest himself. Therefore, O my son, first pray to the Lord the Father, the one who is the origin, to grant you the power to contemplate this God of such indescribable greatness. Even if for now he has only shone on your consciousness with one of his rays, only the consciousness of the soul, an invisible veil because it is itself invisible, if you can, then you will see the Lord with the eyes of your spiritual soul, for he abundantly manifests himself throughout the universe. You are capable of seeing the consciousness of your soul, grasping it with your hands and marveling at the image of God. So if what is within you is invisible to you, how can God be visible within you to your fleshly eyes? If you wish to see him, direct your thoughts to the sun, the course of the moon, the ordered march of the stars. He who maintains this order for all is strictly determined by number and position. The sun, the greatest of the gods of the firmament, to whom all the gods of heaven respectfully yield place as to their king and master, tolerates that the smaller stars move above him out of respect or fear. My son, do not all these stars follow a similar and identical trajectory in the firmament? Who will determine for each the nature and size of its path? See in the great bear that revolves around its own axis and carries the entire firmament in its rotation. To whom does this mechanism belong? Who has set the limits of the sea? Who has founded the earth? It is Otath, the creator and lord of all. No place, no number, no measure expressing cosmic order could exist without him. He shaped every element, and every order is the result of creative activity. The absence of this order manifests where there is neither order nor measure. Yet even this cannot exist without him, my son. For if disorder lacks the essence of order, disorder is just as subject to him who has not yet established his order within it. If you were able to rise into the air as if you had wings and contemplate the stable body of the earth, the immense movement of the sea, the course of rivers, the free mobility of the air, the force of fire, the trajectory of the stars, the path of heaven and around it, the revolution of the universe, what greater grace, my son, than this contemplation? When man perceives all this within himself, instantly the immutable is set in motion and the invisible manifests itself through and within the works. Such is the order of creation, and creation is the praise of order. If you can also perceive God through the mortal creatures that are on earth or in the depths, reflect, my son, on how man is formed in the womb of his mother, carefully study the art of this formation, and learn who is the craftsman of this beautiful and divine image of man, who formed the sphere of the eyes, who clothed the openings of the nostrils and ears, who opened the mouth, who wove the network of muscles and nerves and fixed it to the body, who traced the channels of the veins, who gave the bones their hardness, 
who covered the flesh with skin, who separated the fingers, who widened the soles of the feet, who cleared the joints, who enlarged the liver, who placed the arm, who gave the heart its pyramidal shape, who made the lungs porous, who arranged the space for the abdominal cavity, who highlighted the noble parts and concealed the shameful parts. See what art and what diversity of methods for a single subject, how many masterpieces gathered in a single work, the whole of extreme beauty with perfect proportions and relative diversity. Who made all these things? What other mother, what other father than the invisible God formed everything according to his will? No one claims that there is a statue or a painting without a sculptor or a painter, and this creation would have come into being without a creator or supreme blindness, a total loss of God or extreme closure. Say, my son, never argue with the creator about the work of his hands, give him a better and stronger name than God to express his greatness. Father of all things, the state of fatherhood belongs to him alone. Truly, it is his act of manifestation. Even more boldly, his nature is to fertilize and beget all things. And as without the Creator nothing can exist, so too the Creator of eternity would not be if he did not create eternally in heaven, in the air, on earth, in the depths, in all parts of the universe, in everything that is and is not, nothing in the whole universe that is not him, both what is and what is not. For everything that is he manifests, and everything that is not contains him within it. He is above all names, God the Invisible, but the most manifest. He watches over the spiritual soul, but is also perceived by the eyes. He has no specific form. Rather, he has many bodies, for there is nothing that is not already, for he is all that is. Therefore he also has all the names, for they come from the one Father. That is why he has no name, for he is the Father of all. Who can praise you sufficiently, and according to your merit, where will my eyes direct to praise you? Up, down, inside, outside there is neither path nor place, nor the slightest creature outside of you. Everything is in you. Everything comes from you. You give everything and take nothing, for everything belongs to you. When will I sing your praise, for neither its time nor its hour can be taken? And why will I sing your praise, for what you have created or for what you have not created, for what you have manifested or for what you keep hidden? And with what will I sing your praise? As if I owned something, as if I had something of my own, as if I were someone other than you. Because you are all that I can be, you are all that I can do, it is all that I can say, you are everything. And there is nothing else but you. You are even what is not. You are everything that is born, and everything that is not born. Spirit, when it is the soul, spirit. And she who contemplates you, Father when you give form to the whole universe. God, when you reveal yourself as the universal active force, the good, for you have shaped all things. The most subtle matter is air. The subtlest air is the soul. The subtlest soul is the spirit. The subtlest spirit is God. Chapter 9 Nothing that actually exists is lost, but it is by mistake that changes are called death and annihilation. Hermes, let us now speak, my son, of the soul and the body, of how the soul is immortal, and of the nature of the cohesive and dissolving force of the body, for death has nothing to do with these things. Death, mortality, are but a fiction, a concept derived from the word immortality, from which the first syllable has been removed. Thus mortality is no longer a problem, for death is annihilation, but nothing in the world is annihilated. Indeed, the world is the second God. An immortal being is excluded that the small part of this immortal being dies. Everything in the world is part of the world, and above all man, a being endowed with intelligence. Truly, first and foremost, there is God, the eternal, the uncreated, the creator of all things, the second God. The world is created by him in his image, nurtured and sustained by him, endowed with immortality. For those who are born of the Eternal Father possess eternal life as immortal beings. As immortal creatures we must distinguish eternal life from what is Lord. Indeed, the Eternal comes from no other being, and if it were to be formed, it would be of the same. He never formed himself, but eternal becoming is believed in. Thus the universe is eternally alive through the Eternal, 
but the Father is eternal by himself. The world is therefore eternally alive and divine through the Father of all material substance destined to it. The Father shaped the body of the world, gave it a spherical form, determined the qualities with which he adorned it and conferred upon it eternal materiality, for the material substance was divine. Moreover, after the Father had spread the qualities of the species into the sphere, he enclosed them as in a cave, wanting to beautify his creation with all qualities. He enveloped the entire body of the earth in eternity, so that the material substance would not return to its own chaos. The chaos of wanting to break away from the cohesive force of the body, when the material substance did not form a body, my son was disorderly, and still has some traces of it in its power of growth and decay that man calls death. This disorder, this return, this chaos, exists only in earthly creatures. The bodies of heavenly beings maintain the unique order that the Father gave them from the beginning, and this order is maintained indestructible by the return to the state of perfection. The return of earthly bodies to their previous state consists in the dissolution of the cohesive force, a force that brings bodies back to the indestructible. In other words, for immortal bodies, there is a loss of sensory consciousness, but there is no destruction of bodies. The third living being man formed in the image of the world, unlike other animals, possesses intelligence according to the will of the Father. Not only is he bound by his own decision to the second God, but he approaches an inner contemplation of the being of the first God. He perceives the second God with the senses as a corporeal being, while his inner vision acquaints him with the first God as an incorporeal being, as a spirit, as the good. Therefore this living being is not destroyed, Hermes. May your words be joy and happiness, my son, and understand what God is, what the world is, what it means to be immortal, and what it means to be subject to dissolution. Look at the world born of God, and He, as the source of everything, contains everything, and keeps everything within Him. Chapter 10 Good is found only in God and nowhere else. Hermes, the good Asclepius, is nowhere else but in God. Even God has been the good since eternity. Therefore, this good is necessarily the basis of the essence of all movement and becoming. Nothing is lacking from it. Good is surrounded by a static manifestation force in perfect balance, total fullness, the universal source, the origin of all things. For when I designate the good as sufficient for everything, I refer to the eternal and absolute good. Now, this property belongs to no one else but God, for there is nothing lacking in Him, so that the desire for possession cannot degrade Him. Nothing can be taken away from Him, whose loss could torment him, for suffering and pain are part of evil. Nothing is stronger than him and can fight against him. Nothing is more beautiful than him and therefore cannot inflame him with sensual love. Nothing can refuse obedience to him and thus provoke his anger. There is nothing in him, none of these emotional movements in the universal being. In him there is only good, and as no other property is found in such a being, so good is found nowhere else. For all other properties are found in all beings, great and small, in each one in particular, even in the world, the greatest and most powerful of all manifested life. However, everything that is created is filled with suffering, for generation itself is suffering. Where there is suffering, good is undoubtedly absent. Where good is, there is undoubtedly no suffering. Therefore, good does not reside in creation, but only in what is not created. Yet the substance of all things, a part of what is uncreated, is also as such, a part of the good. In this sense, the world is good, insofar as it also produces all things as good. But in all other aspects, it is not good because it is also subject to suffering, change, and is the parent of creatures subjected to suffering. As for man, he achieves standards of goodness by comparison with evil. Because here, what is not too bad is considered good, and what is considered good is a lesser evil. Therefore, it is impossible for the good in this world to be free from evil. The good in this world is always affected by evil and ceases to be good. Thus, the good degenerates into evil. Therefore, good is only in God, who is good. Among men Asclepius, good exists only as a name and nowhere else in reality. 
this would be impossible. Good cannot find a place in a material body that expresses torment, unbearable tension, pain and desires, instincts, errors, and sensory perceptions on all sides. But the worst of all, Asclepius, is that everything towards which these things push men. What is considered the greatest good here on earth, and not as extreme evil, the instinctive desire of the belly, the cause of all evil actions, is what here on earth leads us away from the good. That is why I give thanks to God, for he has revealed to my conscience and knowledge the good, impossible to find in the world. For the world is filled with evil, it is as if God were surrounded by the fullness of evil, or good by the fullness of God. Around the divine essence radiates the beauty that truly inhabits the being of God in supreme and immaculate purity. Dare to say it, Asclepius, the being of God, if we can speak of it, is the beautiful and the good. Beauty and goodness are not found in those who are in the world. All things perceptible to the eye are appearances like shadows, but everything that escapes the senses approaches closer to the essence of the beautiful and the good. Just as oil has no power to see God, it also does not see the beauty and goodness that are in all their perfection, a part of God, of Him and Him alone, inseparable from His essence and expression of the highest love of God towards Himself. If you can understand God, you will also understand beauty and goodness in the supreme radiance of His splendor, fully illuminated by God, for this beauty is incomparable, this goodness inimitable like God Himself. As much as you understand God, you also understand beauty and goodness, which cannot be conveyed to other beings because they are inseparable from God. When you seek God, you also seek beauty, for there is only one way back, a life of action in the service of God, through Genesis. So those who lack Genesis and follow the fruitful path in God dare to call beautiful and good the man who has never seen, even in a dream, what good is. He who is under the yoke of all kinds of evils, he who takes evil for good, he who seizes evil without ever being satisfied, fearing that it may be taken from him and struggling with all his might to keep it and even strengthen it. Thus Asclepius, with human goodness and beauty, we cannot flee from them or hate them, for the hardest part is that we need them and cannot live without them. Chapter 11 Of Intellect and Senses Hermes, yesterday, Asclepius, I brought you the word of maturity, and on this subject it is necessary to speak in detail about sensory perception. It is thought that there is a difference between sensory perception and intellectual activity, that one is material and the other spiritual, but I am of the opinion that the two are closely related and in no way distinct, at least in man. For without animal sense perception is tied to nature, likewise in man intellect is also. Between the power of thinking and intellect, there is the same relationship as between God and the divine nature. For the divine nature is created by God, and the activity of intellect is created by the power of thought associated with speech, or rather, the activity of intellect and speech are each other's instrument. For speech does not speak without the activity of intellect, and the activity of intellect does not manifest without speech. Thus, Sensory perception and intellectual activity penetrate simultaneously in man as if they were intertwined, for there is no intellectual activity without sensory perception, nor sensory perception without intellectual activity. However, it is possible to conceive of the activity of intellect without direct sensory perception. I am of the opinion that these two activities, when stimulated, awaken with the appearance of dream images for the astral body and the material body question perception, and when these two parts of perception are united, the thought evoked by intellect is expressed by consciousness. Intellect gives birth to all images of thought, the good when it receives the seeds of God, the impious when they come from one of the demons, for there is no place in the world where demons are not found. I speak of demons deprived of the light of God, they insinuate themselves into man, and sow the seeds of their own activity there. Intellect is fertilized by this seed and begets injustice, crime, lack of filial respect, sacrilege, impiety, suicide by hanging or by throwing oneself from rocks, and a multitude of other things that are the work of demons. As for the seeds of God, they are fewer. 
but great, beautiful, and good are virtue, temperance, and happiness in God. Happiness in God is genesis, knowledge that is of God and in God. He who possesses this knowledge is filled with all good and receives from God thoughts very different from those of the multitude. Thus those who walk in genesis do not please the crowd, and the crowd does not please them. They are considered foolish, ridiculed, despised, and sometimes even killed. It is here on earth that evil must dwell, for it was born here on earth. Therefore the earth is its domain, and not the world, as some blasphemers claim. But he who comes before God with respect and love will endure everything, for he participates in Genesis. Everything turns into good for him, even what is evil for others. And if there are traps, he offers them all as an offering in Genesis and transforms evil into good. Now I return to my discourse on perception. The characteristic of man is thus the association between perception and intellect. But, as I have already said, not all men prosper their intellect. Indeed, there is the material man and the truly spiritual man. The material man, bound to evil, receives from demons, as I have said, the germ of his thoughts. The spiritual man, bound to good, is saved by God. God, the demiurge of the universe, molds all his creatures in his likeness. But those who are good from the start abuse their active force. Hence comes the tribute that the earth must pay, crushing everything to produce species of different characters. Some are tainted by evil, others purified by good. For Asclepius, the world also possesses a power of perception and thought, but not in the manner of men, nor as diversified. It is higher, simpler, and truer. The perception and thinking force of the world, instrument created by the will of God, give form to all things and make them disappear of themselves. Keeping within them all the seeds received from God, they create all things according to their own task and vocation. Renewing them after dissolving them, they manifest them differently, for there is nothing that has not received the life of the world, which at the same time brings everything into existence and fills everything with life. It is both the place and the creator of life. Bodies are formed of various materials, part earth, part water, part air, part fire, all more or less composed. The more complex ones are the heaviest, the simpler ones the lightest. The speed of the manifestation of forms here below produces the variegated diversity of these species. In the fullness of life, God is the father of the world and the creator of everything it contains. The world is the son of God, and everything in the world is formed by him. The world is rightly called cosmos, that is to say order, ornament, adornment, for it orders the universe and beautifies it with the diversity of the created, the continuity of life, the tireless ardor of the force of manifestation, the diligence of destiny, the combination of elements and the arrangement of everything that comes into existence. Thus in all living beings, perception and intellectual activity penetrate them from outside, like the breath that surrounds them. But the world received them from God once and for all at its birth. God is not, as some think, devoid of perception and intellect. Those who say so insult him with false respect. All creatures Asclepius are in God, are formed by God and depend on him, whether they manifest themselves as material bodies, rise as beings of soul, or whether they are enlivened by spirit, or whether they are admitted into the realm of the dead. They are all in God, or rather God does not contain all creatures within himself, he is all creatures within himself. He does not add them to himself from outside, but he creates them from his own being and makes them manifest through himself. The perception and thinking power of God are the perpetual movement of the universe, and nothing will ever exist without him, not even the smallest existing thing, that is to say the smallest part of God, for he contains everything within himself. Nothing is outside of his existence, and he is in everything. If you can conceive of these things, Asclepius, you will know them to be true. If you cannot understand them, they will seem unworthy of belief to you, for true understanding is possession of a living faith, while lack of faith is lack of inner penetration. Therefore it is not the intellect that reaches truth, but it is the soul connected to the spirit that has the power, once guided by the intellect, to advance rapidly towards truth. And when in the universal vision one meditates on the whole universe 
and discovers how everything fits according to what the intellect enlightened by inner penetration suggested to it, his faith rises, and in this sublime knowledge of faith, he finds his rest. For those who inwardly grasp the words I have announced here, and which are from God, they will be objects of faith, but for those who lack living understanding, they will be objects of disbelief. This is what I had to say about intellect and senses, the key of Hermes Trismegistus. Yesterday, Asclepius, I gave you my reflections, and it is right that I dedicate today's, which are a synthesis of the most general explanations that God the Father had given me. The good and the bon have the same nature, or rather the same active force, for the word nature encompasses everything that is born and grows according to the will of God, as well as mobile and changing things, as well as immobile and immutable things, divine and human things. The active force of divine things and human things, however, is different, as we have shown elsewhere. Never lose sight of this, for His will is the divine active force, and its principle is the desire to give existence to all things. For who is God the Father the good, if not the reason for being of all things, even those that do not yet exist? Truly He is the reason for the existence of the universe. Thus is God the Father, the good, and no other name can be given to Him. Although the world and the sun are the progenitors of living beings, they are not to the same degree as God, the cause of good and life. And insofar as they are the full and complete cause, it is exclusively by the inevitable action of the will of the good, without which nothing can exist or come into existence. The Father is the cause of His children, of their birth, growth and development, and they receive from the Son the desire for good, for good is the creator of the universe. This cannot be said of anyone else but Him, who never receives anything, but desires that everything exists. I do not say that He does everything, for He who does something sometimes varies in quality and quantity, or sometimes does one thing, then a very different thing. However, God the Father, the good, is in Himself the existence of the universe. For those who can see, it is thus, God desires existence, and He is the existence of everything that is such. He exists solely for one reason, that good reveals itself according to the nature of its principle. O Father, you have so completely filled us with this beautiful and wonderful vision that the eye of my heart has turned to it to approach sanctification. Surely this inner vision of the good is not like the dazzling brightness of the sun, whose light blinds and forces to close the eyes. Inner meditation illuminates, and the more one becomes receptive to the energy it offers, the more understanding acts with great force at the deepest level within us, and will never harm us, for it is full of the divine. One who can access this inner vision often remains amazed in a wonderful contemplation, with his body completely immobile, like our ancestors Uranus and Kronos. May this be the same for us, Father Hermes. May God grant it to you, my son. As for us, we have not yet reached this contemplation. We are not capable of opening the eyes of our soul and entering into the contemplation of the immutable and unimaginable beauty of the good. You will not see it until you have unlearned to speak of it, for the genesis of good is divine silence, soothing all senses. Um, one who has found it once can no longer be interested in anything else. One who has contemplated it once has no eyes for anything else, nor ears for anything else, for even his own body shares this immutability. Indeed, all perceptions and incitements of the body having disappeared, it remains at rest when Genesis illuminates all consciousness, thus rekindling the whole soul and elevating it by freeing it from the body. Thus, it transforms the whole man by imparting to him its fundamental strength. This is because the divinization of the soul, which accompanies the vision of the beauty of the good, cannot be realized in the mortal body. What does divinization mean, Father Hermes? Every isolated soul undergoes changes, my son. And what is isolated, Hermes? Did you not learn in my general explanations that all souls which wander everywhere in the world as if each had been sown in an assigned place have detached themselves from the universal soul? These souls undergo many transformations, sometimes in graceful elevation, sometimes in the opposite direction. Those who crawl become inhabitants of the waters, the inhabitants of the waters become inhabitants of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth become inhabitants of the air, and the inhabitants of the air eventually become humans. Finally, humans enter into immortality 
by transforming into demons and ascending to the heart of the gods. There are two types of paths of the gods, the path of mobile or changing gods and the path of immobile or unchanging gods. The latter state is the most perfect and highest glory of the soul. If the soul that has entered a human body remains in sin, it does not taste immortality and has no share in the good, but hastens to return to the state of the crawling beast. Such is the punishment of the sinful soul. The evil of the soul is its ignorance, its lack of genesis, the knowledge that comes from God, for when the soul misconceives essential things and its own nature, as well as the good, and remains totally blind, it is trapped and violently carried away by carnal passions. Thus, under the sway of evil, the soul, lacking knowledge of its own principle, is subject to an unworthy foreign body. It struggles under the burden of the body, which it does not dominate but which subdues it. Such is the evil of the soul. The virtue of the soul, on the contrary, is Genesis, the living knowledge of God. For the one who possesses this knowledge is good, devoted to God, and already divine. What man is this, Father Hermes? It is a man who speaks little and listens little. Indeed, one who spends his time celebrating or listening to debates struggles against shadows, for God, the Father, the good, cannot be expressed by words nor understood by the ear. It is true that all beings have senses without which they could not exist, but the living knowledge of God is clearly distinct from sense perception. For sense perception arises from influences and impressions that seize us, but Genesis is the fullness of knowledge, knowledge that is a gift from God. For all Genesis is immaterial, the vehicle it uses is the noose, which in turn has as its vehicle the body, and thus, in the body, two activities occur, one operating through gnosis and one operating through matter. For all must make opposition, and contradiction cannot be otherwise. Who is the material God, Hermes? It is the world, which is beautiful and effective, but not good, because it is material and subject to suffering. It is the first of all those subject to pain and the second of all beings, but it does not exist by itself. Its genesis has a beginning, but is eternal. Why? Because by nature it is an eternal becoming, and the reason for this eternal becoming is the creation of qualities and quantities. For every movement of matter is the birth of becoming. Divine immutability gives rise to the movement of matter in the following way. The world is spherical like a head. There is nothing material above this head, nor anything spiritual below its feet. Everything is matter. Now the spirit is also spherical like a head that moves like a sphere, in the head, everything that touches the envelope in which the soul resides is immortal, for the body has been formed, so to speak, within the soul, and the soul is superior to the body. However, everything that is extracted from this envelope is mortal, for it resembles the body more than the soul. Thus everything that lives, even the universe, is composed of matter and spirit. The world is the first creature. After the world, man is the second living being, but the first among mortals. They share with all other living beings the element of the soul. It is not enough to be bad. But even in this negative conception, due to its mortal state, the world is not good because it is mobile, but it is not bad because it is immortal. Man is therefore doubly bad because he is mobile and mortal. The soul of man manifests itself in the following manner. Consciousness in intellect. Intellect in the force of desire. The force of desire in the vital fluid. The vital fluid spreads through the arteries, veins, and blood, animates the animal creature and carries it, so to speak. That is why some think that the soul is the blood. They misinterpret the nature of the soul and blood in this way. But they do not know that the vital fluid first withdraws into the body of desires, that the blood then coagulates, and that when the arteries and veins empty, then the creature dies. Thus occurs the death of the body. Everything rests on this principle, which itself derives from the unique and the only. This principle is set in motion to, in turn, propel the universe. The unique, however, is immobile and immutable. Therefore there are these three. God the Father, the good, the world, and man. God contains the world. The world contains man. The world is the son of God. Man is the son of the world. The grandson of God, one could say. God does not ignore man, on the contrary, he knows him perfectly and wants to be known by him. 
Only one thing liberates, saves, and heals man. Genesis, the knowledge of God, is the path of ascent to Olympus. Only through Genesis does the soul become truly good, not sometimes good, sometimes bad, but good out of inner necessity. What do you mean by that, O Trismegistus Hermes? Think of the soul of a child, my son, when the separation between it and being is not yet complete, when the body is still small and has not reached its full growth. How beautiful it is then to see that it is not yet tainted by the passions of the body and is still largely united with the soul of the world. However, when the body reaches its full growth and the soul is drawn by the burden of the body, it separates from being and falls into forgetfulness. Then it ceases to participate in beauty and goodness, and forgetfulness begets evil. The same goes for those who leave the earthly body. When the soul returns to itself, the vital breath withdraws into the blood, and the self into the vital breath. But when the soul spirit has purified itself of its veils, and taken on a divine nature, it takes on a body of fire, traverses all space, and abandons matter to judge it. What do you mean, Father, when you said that it was not separated from the soul and the soul from the vital breath, and also that the soul was the garment of the noose and the vital breath the garment of the soul? Hermes, one who listens, my son, must be in union of consciousness with one who speaks and follow him in his thoughts. His ear must be even finer and swifter than the speaker's voice. All these veils, my son, are formed in the earthly body because it is impossible for the noose, essentially, to dwell naked in an earthly body. This is because the earthly body cannot bear such a great divinity and a force of such brilliance and purity. It cannot endure being bound by direct contact to a body subject to passions. Therefore the spirit clothes itself with the veils of the soul, which is in some respects also divine. It becomes the servant of the vital breath, while the vital breath governs the creature. When the soul spirit has detached itself from the earthly body, it immediately clothes itself in its own envelope, the mantle of fire which it could not wear while in the earthly body, for the earth cannot bear fire. A single spark would suffice to set everything ablaze. Therefore, the earth is completely surrounded by water, like a sphere to protect it, like a fortification against the flames of fire. The spirit, the swiftest of all creations of the divine spirit, also has as its body the swiftest of all elements, fire. This is because the spirit, the creator of all things, uses fire as a vehicle for the work of creation, universal thought, and thus creates the universe. Human thought creates only what is earthly. For if the thinking power of man is not clothed in fire, it is incapable of giving existence to divine things, and its vehicles keep it within the limits of the human. The truly human soul dedicated to God is in a sense a good demon and is divine. When such a soul separates from the body after following the path of true piety, the path that leads to the birth of the divine and abstains from any harm to others, it becomes a perfect soul spirit. The impious soul, on the other hand, does not change its nature, but it reproaches and punishes itself, and it seeks a new earthly body to avoid this, but only a human body, for no other body can host a human soul. By divine decree, no human soul should descend so low as to inhabit a senseless animal body. There is here a law of God that protects the human soul from great shame, tath. But how is the human soul punished, Father Hermes? Ah, my son, what greater punishment for the human soul than impiety? What fire is more devouring than the flame of impiety? What wild beast kills the body as impiety mutilates the soul? Do you not see the suffering that the soul must endure when it implores for help, crying out, I am burning, the flames are devouring me, I know not what to say or do? Miserable, consumed by the vices that govern me, I see no more, I hear no more. Are these not the cries of a soul undergoing punishment? You, my son, do not believe, like the masses, that the soul, after leaving the body, takes on the form of an animal. That is a profound mistake. The soul is punished in the following manner. When the spirit becomes a demon, it is compelled to take on a body of fire for the service of God. And when this demon enters a deeply impious soul, it lashes it with the whip of sins. Under this whip, the impious soul rushes into all human vices, such as murder, baseness, blasphemy, and violence of all kinds. 
However, when the Spirit penetrates a soul full of piety, it leads it towards the light of Genesis, a soul that never tires of singing the praises of God and that, like the Father, does good to all men through acts and words in various ways. Therefore, my son, in your prayer of thanksgiving to God, you must pray to receive a noble spirit. The soul then rises to a higher good and its fall becomes impossible. There is a community of souls. The souls of gods are in connection with those of men. The souls of men trade with those of irrational beings. Superior beings are above inferior ones. Gods above men, men above the irrational. And God takes care of everything. For he is above all and all are inferior to him. Thus the world is subject to God, man to the world, and irrational entities to man. And God is above all and all, embracing everything in his care. The divine forces that manifest actively are the rays of the sun. The forces of nature are the radiant activities of the world. Manual skill and the desire for knowledge are the radiant activities of man. The divine radiant forces manifest through the world and act on man through the natural radiations of the world. The forces of nature manifest through the elements, and men through their manual skill and desire for knowledge. The universe is governed in the same manner according to the essence of the One, whose spirit permeates everything. There is nothing more sublime and active than His spirit. Nothing stimulates more the union between men and gods, and between gods and men, than His spirit, happiness. The soul entirely filled with it is miserable, the soul deprived of it, tath. What do you mean by that, Father Hermes? Do you believe, my son, that every soul possesses the spirit of good, for it is of this spirit that I speak now, and not of the lower spirit mentioned earlier, and that divine justice has debased? Without the spirit of the soul one cannot often express or act. The spirit then flees, and the soul can neither see nor hear anything. It is like an irrational animal. Such is the virtual power of the spirit. But the spirit does not tolerate any soul incapable of understanding. It leaves the soul attached to the body, and which the body here deprives of its voice. Such a soul, my son, no longer has any connection with the spirit. It can no longer be called human, for man is a divine being who cannot be compared to any creature living on earth, but only to superior creatures, celestial creatures called gods. Or more precisely, if we dare to express the truth, the true man is above the gods and is at least perfectly similar to them in power. In fact, none of the heavenly gods will cross the limits of the heavens to descend to earth. In contrast, man rises to heaven and embraces its expanse. He knows as well the sublimity of the heavens as the things below. He assimilates everything with precision, and above all, he does not need to leave the earth to ascend to the heavens. Such is the extent and scope of what his consciousness grasps. Dare we say that the earthly man is a mortal god? The heavenly God is himself an immortal man. This is how everything manifests through these two entities, the world and man. But all things emanate from the One. In Tad, the universal noose or sanctifying spirit Hermes, the noose proceeds from the very being of God insofar as one can speak of the being of God. Whatever it may be, the noose is the only one to know itself completely. Therefore, the noose is not different from the being of God. It emanates from this source like human light from the sun. The light of men is good. That is why some men are gods, for their human state is very close to the divine state. That is why the good demon has named immortal men gods and mortal men gods. In beings devoid of reason, the noose is nature. Where there is a soul, there is a noose. Just as where there is life, there is a soul. But the soul of beings devoid of reason is nothing more than life without noose, the noose is therefore beneficent for human souls, for it works and shapes them for the good. In beings devoid of reason, the noose acts according to their natural character. In the souls of men, however, it acts in opposition. Suffering and desire torment the soul as soon as it enters the body. Indeed, suffering and desire spread throughout the densified body like a fire into which the soul plunges and remains submerged. If the noose can take charge of the soul, it projects its light onto it, and thus opposes its natural inclinations, just as a good physician cauterizes or removes what is sick in the body. The noose causes the soul to suffer by rooting out lust, the cause of its morbid state. The great illness of the soul comes from its refusal of God, 
whence its erroneous thought that begets evil without bringing any good. Thus, in fighting against illness, the noose restores goodness to the soul, just as the physician restores health to the body. Human souls that do not follow the gnosis are in the same situation as irrational animals. Indeed, the noose acts upon them and frees their desires, whose violence guides and keeps them devoid of reason. Just as irrational beings constantly indulge in their passions and unrestrained lusts and are never satisfied with their sins, the irrational effects of passions and desires are immeasurable evils. God has placed these souls under the relentless yoke of the law so that they may become aware of their wrongdoing. Does all this, O Father, not contradict what you have already told me about destiny? If a man is destined to commit adultery, sacrilege, or any other offence, will he not be punished? So, when one acts only under the imperious constraint of destiny, Hermes, all things, my son, are the work of destiny, and nothing concerning material things, neither good nor evil, occurs apart from it. It is also by destiny that one who does good and beauty experiences consequences. Thus, each one acts and gains experience according to the nature of his actions. But let us leave sin and destiny, of which we have already spoken. Let us now speak of the noose of its powers, of how it acts differently in men and in irrational beings, in whom its beneficial effects cannot manifest, while it extinguishes the passions and desires of men. Among the latter, one must distinguish between those who possess the nous and those who are not bound to it. All men are subject to destiny, subject to birth and change, which are their principle and their end. All men suffer the demands of their destiny, but those who follow reason and walk through gnosis do not suffer it in the same way, for they have detached themselves from what is evil, and therefore do not experience it as an evil. Say, what do you mean then, Father? Is not adultery evil? Is not murder evil? And all the others? Hermes, my son, he who has reason as his guide, will know the suffering of adultery and death, just like the adulterer and the murderer, even if he commits neither adultery nor murder. It is impossible to escape change, birth. But he who possesses the noose can free himself from evil. Therefore, my son, I have always listened to the word of good. If I had not written it down, I would have rendered a great service to humanity. For he alone, penetrating all things as the only begotten Son of God, has uttered truly divine words. Thus, once, I heard him say that all created things are one, especially the embodied beings endowed with intelligence, and that we live from a potential force, from an active force, and from the principle of eternity. Therefore, the noose is good, just as the soul that emanates from it is. Consequently, spiritual things are not divided, and the noose, which is the soul of God and reigns over all things, can accomplish what it wills. Reflect on this, and connect what I have just said to the question you asked me before about destiny and the noose. If you renounce futile polemics, you will understand, my son, that the noose, the soul of God, truly reigns over everything, over destiny, over the law, over everything else, and that nothing is impossible for it. For it can divert the human soul from destiny, just as it can subject it to it if it fails in its duty. These are excellent words spoken by the good. They are divine words, true and luminous, Father, but enlighten me further, I beg you. You said that the noose of irrational beings acts according to their nature and instincts. I think that the instinct of irrational beings is passion. If the noose acts according to instincts and these are passions, does not the noose also transform into passion, since it is affected by pathos? Very well, my son. Your question is useful, and it is right that I answer it. Everything in the body, of an immaterial order, is linked to suffering and is strictly a passion in itself. Everything that generates movement is immaterial. Everything that moves is body. The immaterial moves itself through the noose, and this movement is passion. Thus both are subject to suffering, both the one who generates movement and the one who is moved. The former, because it imposes movement, the latter because it is subject to the impulse of movement. When it does not detach itself from the body, it also does not detach itself from suffering. Perhaps it is preferable to say, my son, that nothing is exempt from suffering, 
that everything is subject to it. The term suffering does not correspond to a similar evil. The first concept is active, the second is passive. Bodies also have their own activity, either they are immobile or they move, and in both cases there is suffering. The immaterial, always inclined to. Action is thus subject to suffering. But do not be deceived by these words, active force and suffering are one and the same thing. However, nothing prevents it from using the most exact and appropriate term. Your answer is very clear, Hermes. So do you think, my son, that only among mortal beings has God given man a double gift, the noose and speech, which are equivalent to immortality? If man uses these two gifts correctly, he will differ in no way from the immortals. Moreover, he will free himself from the body, and thanks to these gifts, he will be admitted into the ranks of gods and the blessed. There are no other living beings that use speech, Father Hermes. They only have sound voice speech, but language differs greatly from voice. For all men share speech in common, but each living being has its own voice or sound. But the language of men does not differ from one person to another, Hermes. Languages do indeed differ, my son, but humanity is one, speech is one, and when it is translated from one language to another, it remains the same, whether in Egypt, Asia, or Greece. It seems to me, my son, that you do not yet understand the wonder and powerful significance of speech. The blessed God, the good demon, has said that the soul is in the body, the noose is in the soul, speech is in the noose, and God is the father of all. Thus speech is the image and noose of God, the body is the image of the idea, and this is the image of the soul. Thus the most useful thing of matter is air, the most useful of air is the soul, the most useful of the soul is the noose, and the most useful of the noose is God. God surrounds and penetrates everything, the noose surrounds the soul, the soul surrounds the air, the air surrounds matter. Destiny, providence and nature are instruments of cosmic order and the disposition of matter. Everything endowed with spirit is principle, and the principle of all things is identical. However, each of the bodies that compose the universe is of a multiple nature. The characteristic of composite bodies is that they invariably retain their essence as they pass from one form to another. Moreover, composite bodies have a proper number. Without this number, nothing could be built, assembled or dissociated. Units give rise to number, which makes these bodies multiple. And when the number decomposes, it absorbs the constituent parts again, while matter remains simple and united. Thus, this entire world, this great divinity in the image of the greatest, which is one with it and which preserves the order and will of the Father, is the fullness of life. Nothing in it or in any of its parts is lifeless, and this throughout the secular march of return that the Father has ordained in the world. There has never been, there is not, and there cannot be anything like death, for the Father wants the world to be alive as long as it retains its cohesion. Therefore, it is necessarily God. How is it possible, my son, that in God, in the one who is the image of the universe, in the one who is the fullness of life, there exists something like death? For death is disintegration, and disintegration is annihilation. How could we think that a part of the incorruptible could decline, or that something of God could be annihilated, Father? Do not say that, my son Hermes, for you would misinterpret the facts. Living beings do not die in him and are not part of him. Hermes, my son, do not say that, for you would misinterpret the facts. Living beings do not die in him and are not part of him. They merely disappear. This disappearance is not death, but the end of cohesion. In reality, this disintegration does not mean destruction, but the possibility of a new future, a renewal. For what is the active force of life? It is not movement. And on earth, what is there without movement? Nothing, my son. But do you not consider the earth to be immobile, Father Hermes? No, my son, that is not the case. It is singular, multiple in its movement and yet enduring. It would be absurd to suppose that the nurturing mother of the universe, who creates, acts, and makes all things grow, is without movement, for without movement nothing can be done. It is absurd to inquire, as you do, whether a quarter of the world is active. For a body without movement means nothing other than an inactive body. 
Know then, my son, that everything, absolutely everything, is in motion, whether to create or to diminish. What is in motion lives, and the holy law demands that nothing that lives remains the same and thus unchanged. Viewed in its entirety, the world has no motion, but all its creations change without perishing or annihilating. It is words, names that plunge man into confusion and anxiety. For life is not birth but consciousness, and change is not death but forgetfulness. Considered thus, everything is immortal. Matter, life, breath, soul, spirit, intelligence, instinct, everything that constitutes every living being. In this sense, every living being is immortal, but more than any other, the one who is ready to receive God and unite with Him, for He is the only one among living beings with whom divinity interacts. He predicts the future in various ways, at night, through dreams, during the day, through signs, through birds, entrails, air, oak trees. Thus, man receives knowledge of the past, present, and future. Pay attention, my son, to the fact that each living being dwells in only one part of the world, the inhabitants of the water in the water, those of the solid ground on the earth, winged creatures in the air. However, man has commerce with all, comes into contact with them, and perceives them with increasing knowledge and understanding. God surrounds and penetrates everything, for he himself is the active and passive force of the universe. Thus, it is not difficult to understand if you want to. Approach God with your thoughts. Contemplate the order of the world and its beauty. Contemplate the necessity of all that you perceive, as well as the providence that reigns over the past and the present. Observe how matter is full of life, and how the movement of this infallible divinity opens up all that is beautiful and good, gods, demons, men. But these are the effects of a force, Father Hermes. If they are only the effects of a force, my son, who sets it in motion? Is there no divinity? Do you see how the sky, the earth, the water, and the air are part of the world? Likewise, life, immortality, blood, destiny, providence, nature, soul, and spirit are aspects of God. Their perpetuity to all is called good. Therefore there is nothing, neither in the present nor in the past, where God is not present. Is God in matter, Father Hermes? If matter were part of God, my son, where would you place it as long as it was not set in motion? Otherwise would it not be merely a confused mass, and if it needed to be set in motion, who would do it? For we have said that active forces are the creations of God, to whom all living beings owe life, to the immortals their immortality. Who causes the change of everything that is changeable, whether you speak of matter, body, or principle? You must know that all this is the effect of God's force. The effect of force in matter forms materiality. The effect of force in bodies forms form, corporeality. The effect of force in principle determines essence. All this is God, the universe. There is nothing in the universe that is not God. Therefore the concepts of size, place, property, form or time do not describe God, for God is the universe and as such he is everything and contains everything. Worship this word, my son, and worship it. There is only one religion, one way to serve and honor God, and that is by not doing evil. Chapter 14 Secret Conversation on the Mountain about Rebirth and the Promise of Silence In your general discourse, Father, you have spoken in riddles veiled in your manner speaking of the divine nature. You have not revealed anything to me about it, saying that no one can be saved unless they are born again. But after the words you spoke when you descended from the mountain, when I begged you to teach me about rebirth so that I might learn it, for it is the only part of the teaching that I do not know, you promised to teach me as soon as I detached myself from the world. Now that is done, and I have strengthened myself internally against the illusion of the world, so deign to enlighten me on what I lack, as you promised, instructing me about rebirth, whether through words or as a mystery. But, Trismegistus, I do not know from which womb or seed the true man is born. Hermes, from the wisdom that reflects in silence, and from the seed that is the only good, my son. Who sows it, father? For that is totally incomprehensible to me. Hermes, the will of God, my son, and what is the nature of the one who will be born, father, 
for he will have no part in my earthly being or in my cerebral thought. Hermes, he will be reborn as a different person. He will be a god, a son of God in all and endowed with all powers. You speak to me in riddles, father, not as a father to his son. Hermes, these things cannot be taught, my son, but if God wills it, he will remind you of them. But what you tell me, father, is beyond my understanding and distresses me. That is why I have only this just response to it. I am a son, estranged from his father's race. Cease pushing me away, father, for I am your legitimate son. Explain to me in detail how rebirth occurs. Hermes, what can I tell you, my son? Only this. When I perceived within me an indefinite vision brought about by the mercy of God, I went out of myself to merge into an immortal body. Thus I am no longer what I was before, but I have been shaped by the spirit, the soul. This cannot be taught or perceived with the material element that allows man to see here below. That is why I no longer concern myself with the composed form that was mine before. I have no color, no sense, no measure, for all of this is now foreign to me. You see me with your eyes, my son, but what I am, you cannot understand by looking at me and seeing with the eyes of the body. Indeed, with those eyes you do not see, my son. You have left me very confused and perplexed, father, for now I cannot even see myself. God will allow you, my son, to go out of yourself like those who dream within the dream, but in your case without sleeping. Tell me again, who causes rebirth? Hermes, the son of God, the unique man according to the will of God. You truly leave me speechless, father, for now I understand nothing. Indeed, I still see you with the same bodily form, the same outward appearance. Hermes, you are also mistaken, for the mortal form changes from day to day. As unreal as it may be, it changes over time, increasing and decreasing. But what is true and real, Trismegistus? Hermes, that which is spotless, my son, that which is unlimited, without color, immutable, naked, formless, radiant, that which knows itself, the unalterable good, the incorporeal. That is beyond my understanding, father. I thought you had made me wise, but all these notions block my understanding. Thus it is, my son, with that which rises like fire or descends like earth or flows like water or blows through the whole universe like air. But how can you perceive by the senses that which is neither stable nor fluid, that which cannot be picked up or grasped and which can only be conceived by its power and active force? That is possible only for the one who has a deep vision of the birth of God. I am not capable of it, Father Hermes. I do not mean that, my son. But enter into yourself, and it will come to you. Desire it, and it will come. Silence the sensory activities of the body, and the birth of the divine will occur. Purify yourself from the irrational punishments of matter. I have tormentors within me, Father Hermes. And they are many, my son, a surprising number. I do not know them, Father Hermes. This ignorance itself is the first punishment, my son. The second is pain, and for suffering, the third is lack of measure. The fourth is covetousness. The fifth is injustice. The sixth is greed. The seventh is lying. The eighth is envy. The ninth is cunning. The tenth is anger. The eleventh is reflection on the law. And the twelfth is malice. There are twelve of these punishments, after which there are many others that in the prison of the body compel man, by the reason of his nature, to undergo the activity of the senses. However, when God has mercy on someone, these punishments diminish, although they do not completely disappear. This explains the nature and meaning of rebirth. Now keep silent, my son. Listen with respect and gratitude. Soon, the mercy of God will become our share. Rejoice, my son, for now the forces of God are purifying you fully for connection with the elements of speech. The knowledge of God reaches us through it and drives away ignorance. Gnosis of joy reaches us, and through it, suffering flees. The force I mention after joy is humility. O oh, wonderful force, let us receive it with joy, my son. See how it wards off lack of measure. In fourth place, I name self-control, the force that opposes greed. And this step, my son, is the support of honesty. For see how it quickly repels injustice, thus we become just. 
now that injustice has vanished, the sixth force I invoke is that which fights against greed, that is, kindness that extends to others. And when falsehood disappears, I call truth again, for then jealousies depart from us and goodness accompanied by life and light follows truth, and no punishment of darkness affects us any more, for they flee. At full speed. Now, my son, you know how rebirth occurs. The arrival of the ten aspects achieves spiritual birth and dissipates the twelve aspects. Thus we become divine through the process of this birth. Now, according to divine arrangements, I have reached contemplation. These things are not visible to me by ordinary vision, but by the power of the forces received. I am in heaven, on earth, in water, in air. I am in animals and plants before, during, and after the prenatal phase. Yes, everywhere. But tell me again how the ten forces ward off the punishments of darkness, which are twelve in number. How does this happen, Trismegistus? Hermes, this structure that we have left is constituted by the circle of the zodiac, which in turn comprises twelve elements. It is a nature, but multiform according to the representation that man's deceptive thought makes of it. Among these punishments, my son, there are some that manifest together, thus haste and reflection are inseparable from anger, and they cannot even be distinguished. Therefore it is understandable and logical that they disappear together when expelled by the ten forces, for it is these ten forces, my son, that give birth to the soul. Life and light are united thus. From the spiritual arises the number of unity. Now, according to reason, unity contains the decade and the decade unity. I see in the spiritual soul the whole universe and myself, Hermes. That is rebirth, my son. It cannot be represented in three dimensions. You know it and feel it now for the interview on rebirth that I have written solely for your benefit, for you to share it, not with the multitude, but only with those whom God has chosen. Tell me, Father, does this new body formed by the ten forces disintegrate one day? Hermes, be silent, do not speak impossible things, for you would sin and disturb the eye of the soul spirit. The physical body endowed with senses is very far from the fundamental divine birth. The first disintegrates, the second is incorruptible. The first is mortal, the second is immortal. Do you not know that you have become a god, a son of the one, like me, by will? Father, I would like to hear the hymn of praise that you said you heard sung by the powers when you arrived at the Ogdoad, which means eighth, the phase of return to God, the absolute being. Hermes, according to what Pimander revealed to me at the Ogdoad, I agree with your desire to tear down this tent, for now you are pure. And Manda the Spirit has not revealed anything more to me than what I have written, knowing that I am able to understand all things, to hear and see everything I desire, and to accomplish all that is good. Thus the forces within me sing in all. Father, I too would like to hear and know all this, Hermes. So be silent, my son, and listen to this hymn of praise so fittingly, the hymn of the Renaissance. It was not my intention to reveal it in this way to everyone, except to you who arrived at the end of this initiation. This hymn of praise cannot be taught. It remains hidden in silence. Therefore, place yourself in an open place in the sky, direct your gaze towards the southern wind after sunset, and there adore. Do the same at dawn, but turn towards the east. And now silence, my son, the secret chant of praise, the sacred formula that all the praise of the cosmos listens to. Let the earth open, let the waters of the heavens open their sources to hear my voice. Silence, trees, for I wish to sing and praise the Lord of creation, the One. Open skies, gentle winds, so that the immortal cycle of God receives my word, for I will sing the praises of the one who created the entire universe, who gave the earth its place and suspended the firmament, who ordered that fresh water flow from the ocean and spread over the inhabited and uninhabited land for the service of existence and for the survival of humanity, the one who ordered that fire shine for every use of gods and men. Let us gather to sing the praises of the one who is exalted above all heavens, the creator of all nature, he is the oil of the Spirit. To Him be the praise of all the forces, or forces within me. Sing the praise of the One and the All, 
Sing according to my will, O forces within my gnosis or holy knowledge of God, enlightened by you. You have given me to sing in the light of knowledge and to rejoice in the joy of the soul spirit. Or you all forces, sing with me this hymn of praise. And you, O humility, and you justice within me, sing for me what is right. O love of the all within me, sing within me the all. O truth, praised be the truth. O goodness, praised be the good. From you, O life and light, comes the song of praise and returns to you. I thank you, Father, for manifesting the powers to me. I thank you, Father, for setting in motion all that is potential. Your word sings your praise for me, receives through. Me the all like the word like the offering of speech. Listen to what the forces within me proclaim. They celebrate the all, they fulfill your will. Your will emanates from you and all returns to you. Receive from all the offering of speech. Hail to the all within us. Illuminate us, O life light God, for the soul spirit is the guardian of your word, the bearer of the spirit of my being. You, you are God. The man who belongs to you proclaims it by fire, by air, by earth, by water, by spirit, by your creatures. I have received from you this hymn of praise of eternity, as I have found by your will the rest I sought. Tath, I have seen how, by your will, this hymn of praise is to be expressed, Father, and now I too express it in the world that is mine. Hermes said, My world. Essentially, it is the divine world. Yes, in the essential world, Father, I have this power through your hymn of praise and the expression of your gratitude. The illumination of my soul spirit has become perfect. Now I too want to give thanks to God from the depths of my being. Hermes, do not be rash, my son. Listen, Father, to what I tell you in the soul spirit. To you, first artisan of the Renaissance, to you, my God, I, Dad, offer the offering of speech, O God, your Father, your Lord, your Spirit. Accept from me the offering you desire from me, for the entire process of the Renaissance is accomplished according to your will. Hermes, my son, you thus offer to God, the Father of all things, an offering pleasing to him. But add this, Dad. I thank you, Father, for the counsel you have given me. Hermes, I rejoice, my son, that you have obtained the good fruits of truth, an immortal harvest. Truly, promise me now, after learning this from me, that you will keep silent about this marvellous power, that you will not tell anyone how the Renaissance is accomplished, lest you be counted among those who profane the teaching. It is enough that we both have made it ours, you speaking, me listening, in the light of the Spirit. Now you know yourself, yourself and our Father. Consider your age and the knowledge of the nature of things you have acquired. If everything that comes into existence comes into existence, or has come into existence not of itself, but by another, and if all things that exist are different and dissimilar and owe their birth to another, then there is certainly one who is their creator. But this creator was not born himself. It is said that he existed before all that was created, for what is created is born from another, as I have said. Therefore, nothing can be before all comes into existence except the one who has never been begotten. The Creator is also the most powerful, and He is the only one truly wise in all things. For nothing existed before Him, for He is the first both in numerical order and in greatness, in the difference between Him and all creatures, and in the continuity of His creation. Moreover, all creatures are visible. Only He is invisible, precisely because He creates to become visible. Thus, He creates constantly, and in this way renders Himself visible. We must think thus, and from this thought marvel and consider ourselves blessed to have learned to know the Father, for what is more marvellous than a true Father? Who is He today, and how can we know Him? Is it right to call Him only God? Shouldn't we also call Him Creator, Father, or perhaps all three? Creator for His activity, Father for His goodness, for He is powerful given the diversity of manifested and active things. Indeed, everything comes into existence through Him. We must clearly distinguish between what is created and the Creator, without ambiguity or endless word games, for there is no intermediary or third between them. So distinguish them in all that you understand and learn and convince yourself that they contain and encompass everything. 
Let no uncertainty escape you on this matter, whether concerning things above or below, divine things, or what is changing or belongs to hidden things. All that exists can be summarized in these two, that which is created and the Creator, and nothing can separate them, for the Creator does not exist without the creation, for one is what the word indicates, and nothing more. Therefore one cannot be separated from the other, no more than the Creator can be separated from himself. The Creator is simply, purely, uncompounded, and must necessarily be identical to himself, for the creation of the Creator is the birth of a state of being, and what is begotten cannot exist as if it had extended itself. Thus, a creation must necessarily be begotten by another than the Creator. Without the Creator, therefore, nothing manifests and nothing exists. If the Creator and the creature are separated, each loses its own identity, for it is deprived of its complement. Thus, we recognize that reality is summed up in these two, the Creator and the creation. We recognize that they form a unity, indeed, of which one cannot do without the other. First, there is the creative divinity, then comes the creation, whatever it may be. Do not fear that the distinction I have made diminishes the respect due to God or to His glory, for there is only one glory for Him, to give life to all beings, to create, shape, and give life. It is indeed the body of God. Never believe that the Creator ordained something bad or ugly, for evil and ugliness are inseparably linked to generation, like rust to iron and impurity to the body. It was not the blacksmith who created rust, it was not the parents who caused the defilement of the body, and it was not God who created evil. It is usage, the wear and tear of created things that produces the side effect of evil, and it is precisely to purify what is created that God has established change. If a painter can depict the sky and the gods, the earth and the sea, man and animals and inanimate things, would not God be capable of creating all this? What folly, what ignorance to think this of God! Those who have such ideas experience the strangest things, for while they claim to praise and respect God, they refuse to recognize Him as the Creator of all things. Thus, they not only testify to not knowing Him, but also commit the most horrible of blasphemies by attributing to Him pride and impotence. For if God were not the Creator of all beings, it would be as if He despised giving them life, or was not capable of doing so. Thinking thus is truly impious, for God has only one attribute, goodness. Universal good is neither prideful nor powerless. That is what God is, goodness, omnipotent, creating the universality of things. The entirety of creation comes from God, from He who is absolute goodness and has the power to generate all. If you now want to know how God creates and how creation comes into existence, here is a fair and beautiful parable. Imagine a farmer who sows seeds in his field, here wheat, there barley, elsewhere different seeds. See how he plants life here, an apple tree there, and other types of trees in other places. Similarly, he sows immortality in the sky, change on earth, life and movement in the universe. Thus these aspects of his activity are limited, few in number, and easy to count, numbering four, plus God himself and that which is created. These six together constitute the universality of what exists. Chapter 16 of Hermes Trismegistus of the Soul Hermes says, The soul is a being without a body, and although it is in the body, it loses nothing of its own essence. By virtue of its own being it is in perpetual motion, moving itself through the activities of thought. It does not move in anything, nor with respect to anything, nor for anything, for before the forces become active, it is, and what comes before does not need what comes after. In something, location applies to time, to the natural movement of growth. With respect to something, it refers to harmony, to the particular aspect, to form. For something, it refers to the body. For location, time and the natural movement of growth exist for the needs of the body. There is an original connection between these notions, for it is true, so to speak, in a certain way, that a body needs a place, and no body can be formed without a place, without space subject to natural changes, for no change is possible outside of time and without natural movement. And finally, no body can be formed without harmony. 
So space and location are incorporeal, just as time and natural movement are. Each has its own nature. The proper nature of location is to contain within itself. The proper nature of time is to cancel or add. The proper nature of nature is movement. The proper nature of the body is change. The proper nature of the soul is to penetrate into its true being through thought. What moves is the driving force of the universe, for the nature of the universe gives it two movements, one because of its own power, the other because of its power of creation. The first penetrates into the world and maintains its internal cohesion, the second causes its expansion while containing it externally. These two movements always occur together in everything. The nature of the universe brings existence to all things and gives them the power to grow, on the one hand, by making them sow their own seeds, on the other hand, by providing them with a moving matter. This movement heats the matter which becomes fire and water, fire full of power and force, water passive. The fire oscillates, the water dries part of itself, and thus the earth was formed, floating in the water. The continuous drying of the water around the earth released the steam of the three elements, water, earth and fire, and thus the air appeared. These elements combine according to the law of harmony. The union of heat with cold, of dryness with humidity, gave birth to a breath of life and to a seed corresponding to the breath of life that surrounded it. When this seed descends into the mother's womb, it is not inactive in the seed. It transforms it, causing it to grow and develop. During this expansion, everything happens as if the seed brings an external form and shapes itself accordingly. This form, in turn, serves as a vehicle for the inner form. Thus each thing receives its own appearance. Since the breath of life did not receive a vital impulse in the mother's womb, but simply a natural growth impulse, it also harmoniously engendered a vital impulse, so that the thinking, indivisible and immutable life that never loses its immutability could be received there. According to numbers, what is in the mother's womb becomes reality through the process of birth, and brings forth what was to be born. The closest soul connects to it not according to its own nature, but according to the decrees of fate, for by nature the soul does not wish to remain in the body, only out of obedience to fate. The soul confers upon the newborn the movement of thought, mental matter and inner life. The soul penetrates into the breath of life and stirs within it, awakening life. The soul is an incorporeal being. If it had a body it could not sustain itself, Every body needs existence, needs the life it possesses as the foundation of order. Everything that is born is also subject to changes, for everything that is born has a certain extension and grows. When something is born it grows, but all growth again goes through a decrease, a diminution, and then comes dissolution, disintegration. What is born lives, and to have a share of the vital form it is linked to the existence of the soul. But the cause of existence for other reasons already exists in advance. By existence I mean to be endowed with reason and to have a share of thinking life. It is the soul that confers thinking life. What is born is called living for rational life, for the power of thought, mortal for the body. Therefore the soul has no body, for it maintains its strength without failing. But how can we speak of a living being if there is no life-giving principle? Even less could we speak of a rational being without the existence of a thinking nature that confers thinking life. As the body is composed, thought does not reach harmony in all men. For if the composite body has an excess of heat, man becomes airy and excited. And if there is an excess of cold, he becomes heavy and sluggish. There are three types of harmony according to heat, according to cold, and according to temperature. Nature ordains according to the star that dominates in the constellation of stars, and the soul, endowed with a body by decree of fate, accepts it and confers life to this work of nature. Thus, the soul is a perfect being in itself, which originally chose a life according to fate, and attracted a form consisting of vital force and boiling desire. The vital force serves as material to the soul. When this vital force has engendered a state of being conforming to the soul's thought image, it is full of energy 
and does not succumb to apathy. Desire also presents itself as material. When it has engendered a state of being conforming to the soul's ideas, it becomes moderate and does not yield to the thirst for enjoyment. For the reasonable power of the soul fills the dissatisfaction of desire. Thus, when the vital force and desire collaborate and have formed a balanced state of being and they are constantly oriented towards the soul's reason, they create a correct inner disposition. For the perfectly balanced state of being they create restrains the excess of vital force and, on the other hand, satisfies the dissatisfaction of desire. What guides them, then, is the power of thought, belonging to itself in its prudence, having power over its own reason. The being of the soul governs and directs like a sovereign, like a guide, the reason that inhabits it, directing like a counsellor. The prudence of the soul is thus the knowledge of thoughts that gives to what is devoid of reason, and understanding a slight and insignificant hint of reasonable power compared to that power, but nevertheless reasonable compared to reason, like the echo compared to the voice or the glow of the moon compared to the sun. A certain amount of reasonable thought thus creates harmony between the vital force and desire, maintaining balance mutually and attracting to them a flow of reasonable thought like an endless circular movement. Every soul is therefore immortal and is always in motion. We have indeed said that movements come from forces or bodies. We further say that the soul emanates from an essence other than matter, for it is incorporeal, just as what happens to existence necessarily arises from something else. All beings that are born and are then subject to destruction necessarily possess two movements, namely the movement of the soul that animates them, and the movement of the body that makes them grow, diminish, and then dissolve by disintegration. Thus describes the movement of mortal bodies. Now the soul is always in motion, itself exists by continuous movement, and transmits movement to other things. Viewed thus, every soul is immortal, for it is the activity of its own nature. As it maintains movement, there are divine souls, human souls, and souls without reason. The divine soul is the active force of its divine body, moves within this body, and thus generates movement in it. When the soul is freed from mortal beings and from what did not respond to reason, it enters the divine body, within which in an unceasing movement it is carried by the universe. The human soul also has something divine, but it is linked to irrational aspects related to desire and vital force. Undoubtedly these aspects are immortal to the extent that they are active forces, but they are forces of the mortal body, and are thus very distant from the divine part of the soul that dwells in the divine body. The soul of beings devoid of reason consists solely of vital force and desire. They are said to be unreasonable because they lack a rational aspect. Finally, think of the soul of inanimate things, which although outside bodies, animate them. This soul could move exclusively in the divine body and thus activate these things, so to speak, second hand. The soul is therefore an eternal being, endowed with intelligence, whose thought is its own reason, and when it is united with a body, it attracts to itself the mode of thought of harmony. However, once liberated from the physical body, the autonomous and free soul belongs to the divine world. The soul governs its own reason and gives to what comes to life a movement in accordance with its thoughts, a movement called life, for it is the prerogative of the soul to transmit to others something of its own being. There are therefore two types of life and two types of movement. One is the movement of the soul's being, the other that of the body of nature. The soul is autonomous, the other is imposed. Indeed, everything that moves is subject to the constraint of what generates the movement. But the movement that moves within the soul is indissolubly united with the love that leads to the divine reality. The soul is indeed incorporeal, for it does not belong to the physical body. For if the soul had a body, it would have neither reason nor thought, for the entire body lacks thought. On the other hand, the thinking being owes its breath of life to the fact that it participates in the being of the soul. The life spirit or spirit belongs to the body, reason to the being of the soul. Reason takes everything beautiful as the object of contemplation. The spirit that observes with the senses perceives phenomena. This spirit pervades all the organs of perception that constitute its various parts, 
and includes a spirit of sight, a spirit of hearing, a spirit of taste, and a spirit of touch. When this life spirit, this breath of life of the body, transforms into a kind of sensory intelligence, it senses sensibly, otherwise it simply presents things, for it belongs to the body and is receptive to everything. In contrast, reason belongs to the innermost essence of the soul and judges with understanding and intellect. Reason possesses knowledge of divine things on its own. The life spirit represents appearances, that is, apparent images. The life spirit draws its life force from the surrounding world, while the soul draws its life force from within. For the being of the soul, reason, thoughts and understanding or the power of understanding. The power of representation and sensory perception contribute to understanding, which is the power of comprehension. Reason, which is the prerogative of the soul, creates thoughts that merge into understanding, the power of comprehension. These four elements, which are interconnected, constitute a single form, the form of the soul. The understanding or power of comprehension of the soul contributes to the power of representation and sensory perception. However, these are not constant and function more or less or diverge from each other. They weaken to the extent that they deviate from understanding. But when they follow it and obey it, they are in agreement through the sciences with the higher reason. We find ourselves in a state of choice. It is within our power to choose what is better and also what is worse, despite ourselves, for choice, linked to the soul, is part of the nature of the body. Therefore, fate rules over one who makes such a choice, for the higher reason, the thinking being that we carry within us, is autonomous and always remains true to itself. Fate has no control over it. However, when the thinking being deviates from the Logos, whose thought penetrates all and which is the first after the first God, then it depends on the entire plan that nature has established for creation. When the soul is thus connected to creation, it also depends on fate, although it does not partake of the nature of created things. Chapter 17. Hermes Trismegistus on Truth Hermes, it is not possible for a man, an imperfect creature composed of imperfect members, and whose envelope is formed of many heterogeneous elements, to dare to speak of truth. But what is possible and correct to say, and what I say, is that truth resides only in eternal bodies, whose every element is true. Fire that is once and for all fire and nothing more, earth that is once and for all earth and nothing more, air that is once and for all air and nothing more, water that is once and for all water and nothing more. On the other hand, our bodies are composed of all these elements. They contain fire, earth, water and air, but they are neither fire, nor earth, nor water, nor air, nor any reality. Therefore, if our bodily constitution did not receive the truth from the outset, how can it perceive the truth expressed? And you will understand that God wills it so. Therefore, all things belonging to the earth are not truth, but imitations of truth, and not even all, only a few. The rest are lies. When appearance receives the blessing from above, it is an imitation of truth. Without the power from above, it remains a lie, a non-truth. The same applies to a painting representing a body. It is not the body that corresponds to the form of the subject seen. We see eyes, but they have no gaze, ears, but they hear nothing. All the elements shown in the painting are only appearances intended to deceive the observer's perception, who believes he sees the truth when he sees only a lie. When we see something that is not a lie, we see the truth, for we see or understand those things as they truly are. We see and understand true things. If they are otherwise, we perceive or know nothing true. Truth also resides in the earth. Father Hermes, you are mistaken, my son, for without a doubt, truth does not exist on earth and cannot manifest itself here. However, it is possible that some men to whom God gives the power to see contemplate the truth. There is nothing real on earth, Hermes. I think and say that everything is appearance, illusion. These are the true things I think and say. One should not call truth thinking and saying true things. Hermes, how is this possible? One must think and say what is nothing. There is no truth on earth. What is certain here below is that there is nothing certain. How could it be otherwise, my son? Truth is perfect magnificence, absolute good, 
uncontaminated by falsehood and unencumbered by a body. Truth is naked, radiant, inviolable, sublime, immutable. But look, my son, how powerless the things of this world are to receive this good, for all are perishable, subject to suffering, dissoluble, mobile, ever-changing, and passing from one form to another. How could these things be the truth when they are not true in themselves? Everything that changes is a lie because it does not essentially remain the same, passing from one form to another and always presenting us with new appearances. Is that not true, man himself, Father Hermes? Not as man, my son, for what is true is that which consists in itself and remains as it is. Man, however, is composed of many elements and does not remain as he is. On the contrary, he changes and transforms from one age to another, from one form to another. While he is in his envelope, it is but a short time. Many fathers no longer recognize their sons and vice versa. Perhaps a being that changes to such an extent and is no longer recognizable would be rather false, for during his changes he assumes so many different appearances. Understand that only what is permanent and eternal is true. Man is not eternal, so he is not true either. Man is an apparent form, and as such, quite false. But Father, even the eternal bodies that change are not true, Hermes. Nothing that is generated is subject to change, that is true. But as these bodies were created by the first Father, it is possible that the matter of which they are made is true. These bodies have no truth because of their changes. There is no truth, but only that which remains identical to itself. But Father, what then can we call truth? Hermes, only the Son can be called true. For while everything else changes, the Son does not change and remains identical to itself. Therefore, only it is responsible for shaping everything in the world, governing everything and generating everything. It is to Him that the truth of His being pays homage after the first and only. I acknowledge Him as mine, the builder of the world. And who is the first truth, Father Hermes? The one who is not made of matter, who is not in a body, who has neither color nor form, who does not change, who is not changed, who always is. Moreover, everything that is not true is perishable. The providence of truth maintains the decomposition of everything on earth, retains it there, and will do so eternally, for without decay there is no generation. Each generation is succeeded by decomposition, so that new creatures may be born. Everything that is born must necessarily be born from what decomposes, and what is born must necessarily decompose, so that the generation of beings does not come to an end. Recognize this as the first and active cause of the generation of beings. Therefore, those who are born from decomposition can only be false, for they are born once of one type and another time of another, different for it is impossible for them to be reborn exactly the same. How then can that which is not reborn identical be true? Therefore it must be called appearance to be correctly designated. Man, the appearance of a man, the child, the appearance of a child, the young man, the appearance of a young man, the adult, the appearance of an adult, the old man, the appearance of an old man, for a man is not a true man, a child is not a true child, an adult is not a true adult, an old man is not a true old man, for things change and lie so much in the past as in the present. However, my son, know well that even these false phenomena of this world depend on the truth from above, and as it is so, I declare that appearance is the work of truth 